Yeah, it's so like my ability to choose good and wrong, or my ability to like do works of, of good or works of evil. Yeah, what we would define that as a moral public role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, not having a pre-mortal life would pose a big problem to that. How so? Well, if, if I was created from nothing, right, and in God's infinite core knowledge, I already knew what, what place he's going to put me in, or what decisions I'd make, given what circumstances. That's a pretty standard Latter-day Saint view, though. No, it's not, actually. Most Latter-day Saints we talk to believe in divine, definite foreknowledge. I don't, I don't really give a shit what most Latter-day Saints have to say. But thank you. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Most of your leaders, though, have taught that God knows the definite future. I mean, when they've spoken on the issue. Yeah, yeah. but you know the story of Osler and Maxwell. You told me it. You recounted it to me before. Where Blake Osler corrects Neil and Maxwell on timelessness. And he agrees with them on this point. I don't, I don't know how that, what the outcome was. But, okay. but, the, he changes the, his book. but the dominant position of historic Latter-day Saint theology is that God knows the definite future. Okay, that's the dominant position for just traditional Christianity in general. I would expect those Protestant presuppositions to be within Christendom in general. I don't, I don't, people haven't really given much thought in Latter-day Saint uh, dialogue. But your leaders have taught that God knows the definite future. I think that the Bible teaches that. I'm, I'm, that who's posing a problem, that's why I brought it up, Yeah. with uh, agency. And it also would contradict to a lot of the prophecies in the Bible, if that's true. I don't think your leaders think that's true. Okay, we're, we're, I was just appealing to your authority, right? My authority? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, no. Because the Bible would disagree if that... Uh, oh, oh you're th- the objective authority. The, the Bible, the, the Bible teaches no that... The Bible holds that God knows the definite future. I would say some uh, verses in the Bible indicate that, yeah. The, and then the, the Bible also shows that that's not the case. The predominant Latter-day Saint interpretation of the Bible from the leadership. What do you mean from the? Can you, so can you provide quotes from leadership? Not offhand. Okay. But I, th- I don't think that's it's easily. I don't, I don't think you would be on good footing to argue that the dominant LDS position is that God doesn't know the future. So so do I'm going to show you in the Bible? But I don't want to interrupt too too harshly. Uh, do you want to, I can show you. I can show you in the Bible. Yeah, okay. yeah, but you probably don't want to talk about it, right? <laughs> um. If you can show me something from the Bible that your leaders have interpreted a certain way and you want to appeal to... So, so why are you giving me that criteria? Because I care, at the apologist level, I care less about... I'm not an apologist. Well, you're functioning as one, as a straight apologist. No, I'm not doing that either. Yes. It's not. What do you... Yeah. I don't... What it, I don't have that profession. I don't... Not as a profession, but in sort of the Zachary Wright... Uh, I am not Zachary Wright's level. Steven Smoot. I'm not uh, that level in the slightest. I am Dustin. the incredible boy of the Incredibles. Okay. In, 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 in reference to them. But I assume you want to promote the Latter Day Saint religion. Do I, yeah, because I mean, yes, I would say I would assume that all Latter Day Saints want to promote their own religion. So if you're functioning at some level as a Latter Day Saint apologist, even at a, an amateur street level, I'm an amateur. I'm not a professional apologist. But if you're doing that in any significant capac- significant capacity then it becomes less about interfaith dialogue with you as an individual and more, I become more interested in how your positions align with your own church. And so if you're giving something that's an idiot... I don't represent my church. I don't want my, you know, you don't represent your church, do you? Would you say that you do? Here's a quick way to put it. You can't speak for your church. No. But I, you can't speak I, with your church. What do you, I, what do you talk, I don't have a distinction. What are you talking about? You can't speak... I'm a, speaking for me. But you can't speak authoritatively like your own leaders can, right? What are you talking about? I, I'm not an apostle. Right. So you're not a leader, and you can't speak authoritatively for the whole church. But you should be able to speak in unity with your church. What, is, what does that mean? Could you speak in unity with your church? Yes. Um, God you know, never was a theology? sinner. Yeah. I don't believe that God was ever a sinner. Well, I can speak with the unity of 100% of Christians on that, of all historic Christians and all historic Christian churches. Okay. But you, you can't, you can't do that. that. Right. But you can't speak... When... when Historic Christians could affirm. You speak, could you speak with 100% assurity that every that every Christian believes that the egg and, uh, analogy of the Trinity doesn't uh, actually it shows modalism, right? Um, or, or, I, I think some people would use the egg analogy at a street level. Yeah, I, I heard. But I, what do you mean at a street level? What is that criteria? If you're at a seminary, if you're looking at historic Protestant confessions, if you're looking at 
the main proponents historically of the Nicene Creed. So, that, so are you saying hold, that hold, the thought. I, no, 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 no. Are you saying that the informed Latter Day Saint would have a differing opinion than the general consensus of the street member? On the issue of whether Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinful mortal, there is no distinction between an academic Protestant and a non-informed Protestant. There is no uninformed Protestant who would affirm that Heavenly Father may have been a sinner. I really pulled out. So we're talking. We're talking about the. I was talking about the Trinity, right? And so that's a pretty big. Well, thing I was talking about. Wrong. I was talking about that's theology that's proper. A, that's a pretty big thing to get wrong, right? Well, I re re rewind. I started with Trinity? whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal is even more I obvious. With, I started with was the egg a good analogy to represent the Trinity? But rewind. But what we're talking about is speaking with the church. You're not being consistent with how you're using uh, church's authorities amongst different. I mean, uh, my church and in, in, in your church or churches. You're not, you're not holding, you're not being consistent. When I affirm a position, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll, try to not, I'll try not to elongate this. When I affirm a, a position like Heavenly Father never was a sinful mortal, it's true, it's essentially true, it's beautiful and worthy of worship. Okay, that's a subjective claim. Okay. Hold on, let me finish it. It's true, it's essentially true, it's beautiful and worthy of worship. Okay, well, hold, up, hold, up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. And no, it's, I don't, I, I no, don't no, no, hold no. Up because you're going to hear so many presuppositions. Only four. You're Only four. The, the fourth one is, and it's something that I'm not confessing merely in solo enterprise fashion. I'm confessing and affirming that with all other Christians. So when a Latter-day Saint who follows the more Oslerian... Uh, what, is, what is Oslerian? What does that mean? If you're, you're, if you're, if you're, if you're holding the views of something that approximates more of Blake Osler, you hold the position that Heavenly Father has always been God, for example. He never had to become God. He's always been God. Such Oslerians, I don't mean that to denigrate. It's not a diminutive, but it's just a, no, a you're label. Just, you're just saying that, uh, you know, the informed members of the church and then the you know, traditional casual members of the church. When someone such as yourself affirms that Heavenly Father never was a sinner, it's often the case, please correct me, that even though affirming that, they would not say it's essential for worshiping him. No, he wouldn't say that. Right. And it's not so, something you're affirming with your church. Yeah, so where is, I guess then where does the Bible say it's essential to affirm that God is not a sinner? In Revelation 4, verse 8, it yeah. says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Okay, so you're saying that even though I am a sinner, I can't be holy, right? I, there's never You can't become the kind of being who was always holy okay, that's not what in that all eternity. So you're just injecting, who was and is so and is to come. Injecting your interpretation into Revelation, and you're suggesting that it means that God was never a sinner. Even though multiple times can Davidic kings be called holy, and there were probably sinners as well. So I, I probably wouldn't use that interpretation because you're going to be conflicting yourself with uh, what you think is a sole, infallible, consistent rule of faith, the Bible alone. To be clear, do you think Heavenly Father is sinless in the same way that David is sinless? No, I didn't. So I was, I was asking you why you're the then. Bible that, that way. Unpack that, because I, I don't think that the purity of the God, most high God never sinned. He is the orbiter of the law. But when I affirm the, the, the eternal sinless purity of God. Yeah, you're using those verses, right? Mm -hmm. Hold up, finish the I thought. When I affirm the eternal sinless purity of God, I'm not affirming it in the same way that I would, for example, an angel that's never sinned. When, when I say that God never sinned, I'm saying that that's essentially who he is. I'm affirming yeah, yeah, that. We have no basis for that, though. I'm you affirming just, that. Show me a Bible verse that teaches that. With all the other Christians. Your, 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 your highest rule of faith doesn't teach that. That so God never was a sinner? That? No, that it's essential to believe that in order to be a Christian. It's essential, to, it's essential for God to never have sinned to be God. And there are no Christians who believe God okay, might have so been a sinner. True, that's true for David, for any of the Davidic kings, right? And that's true for Samuel the prophet, right? That they never sinned? Yeah. Is that, what that David never sinned? Is that what you're suggesting? I don't follow you, sorry. I'm not trying to be okay, so crafty if, here. No, that's totally fine. If king, if the Davidic kings are called Elohim, and Samuel the prophet is called Elohim, then why should we assume that being God thus means that it, they can't sin? I don't... What, is it, what are you talking about? The Bible doesn't speak the same way about David as it does about God. The, no, it's, there's only, it only okay, says... That, so you, finishing the thought real quick. It, it only says of humans. God, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. No one's described that way other than God. So when the Bible talks, when it was a psalm that was read to the Davidic kings calling them Elohim, right? What are you thinking of? Sorry. So when the Bible, when the psalms... Wh which psalm are you thinking of? Um, I can find it for you. Choosing where you want to be. Just as a courtesy, uh, we are mic'd up psalm right now. Psalm 45, 67. That's it? fine. Yeah. That's fine. Psalm 45, 67. Want to read it? Yeah, sure. 
Yeah. Then I think we put that up where XLP will come in. Yeah. Nothing to do. Different clubs. So my club's pretty low, low, and just like different parts. You need a god, and it's the bone I told you. Well, it's all right. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thy scepter of thy kingdom is a right, is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This was specifically the psalm written to the Davidic kings. That's what okay. they call them. Okay. And so, when the author of Hebrews uses it in reference to Jesus Christ and God the Father, that is exactly what you were just asking me about. When is the Davidic king is ever equated the same way as God is equated right here in Psalms and right here in Hebrews. So in, in the history, in the Christian tradition, reading that, hold on. I would, I would recommend not following the rhetorical patterns of Travis Anderson here. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I think I learned this from Travis Anderson. Well, maybe the community that you're in has a, has a style of rhetorical aggression that doesn't allow for complete thoughts. I actually think you're... I, I, I would feel the same way about probably all of uh, traditional Christian theology. I don't, I don't, that's just a subjective claim. I don't, uh, your opinion is... Up Talking about the mode of speech and interfaith dialogue, I think we should, there's a, there's a little bit of a threshold of interaction, yeah. of interruption where there's a kind of like excited back and forth, but we should allow each other to f finish most thoughts. Um, in, in, unless I'm going on and on and on, but the, in the Christian tradition, when we read such, pa such passages, the idea is that David is a type of Christ to come. That there are certain things said of David that are more true of Christ than they are of David. That they are exemplified in Christ in the way that they're, they're not exemplified in David. That okay, they, so they you're become. Saying, so you're saying that there's scriptures that talk about David the same way they talk about Christ. Right? Of Moses, Abraham, yeah, so that, Joshua. So that contradicts what you're telling me before. That that's because you just said originally said the opposite. No, that the things that are true of these um, typological figures are pointing to something that's crystallized in the person of Jesus that is even more true of Jesus than it is of these sinful yeah, yeah, yeah. So figures. So the prophets would read or cite these things in a coronation to the Davidic kings, essentially they're lying is what you're suggesting. No, I, I mean, for example, thinking of Israel or Adam, there are certain things spoken of Old Testament figures or the nation of Israel that are really pointing through and beyond Israel and these figures to Christ. So when I say, for example, that someone's king, right, or father, or shepherd, and say yeah. a Davidic king, so, really, I think you'll agree with me. There's a sense in which David is a shepherd, David is a king, David is a kind of like a, a kind of like a father. Yeah, that's, just, that's not a, that's not a good equation with the state of Israel, because Israel is actually those things that the scriptures are telling it it is. But you're telling me that David wasn't actually those things when the Psalms tell that David is. Well, Jesus is a shepherd. He is the shepherd in a way no other shepherd was. He is the king of kings in a way no other king was. He is the prophet, the priest, the king in a way that Israel wasn't, Adam wasn't, David wasn't, Joshua wasn't, even though that all those Old so Testament we figures prefigure Christ. Yeah, so if we were to say that like um, Melchizedek was a king, we'd be like lying. If we were to say yeah. that. It's that he, as a person, as a real person, as a real king, that he himself is providentially... Um, designed by God to point to something bigger and better than beyond himself. That, that Melchizedek, yeah. in, in Hebrews 7, Melchizedek, uh, the person and the story of Melchizedek, functions to point to something beyond Melchizedek, which is more true. Uh, he is the king of peace. How, how does that go in Hebrews 7 uh, of, of Salem? I forget the exact wording. There are things said about uh, Melchizedek that are even more exemplified in the person of Christ than they are in Melchizedek himself. Okay, so then to equate Melchizedek with Jesus, that would be incorrect, right? We wouldn't want to equate, but we yeah. would want to have analogy with. Yeah. That's, that's even so the, the language of Hebrews 7. He's, yeah, there's so, a resemblance. So Yeah, so then we shouldn't, like you were saying, uh, when you're telling me that if there's any scriptures that equate, that don't equate, but more to Jesus by talking to David, right? Was calling them the same names, calling them holy. Those titles are more properly owed to Christ than they are even to the original recipients okay. that, are, that are not Christ. Okay. That they ultimately, the, the title shepherd and father and king and prophet and priest ultimately and properly belong to God and to the, to the very person of Jesus Christ in a way that they don't belong to any other. So, okay, so then when, I, when you asked me to show scriptures where the Bible is talking about David the same way it talks about Christ. I'm not sure if I asked you to, sorry. So when, we're, when originally I was telling you that, um, you know, David is called Elohim and Samuel is called Elohim. And um, you had asked me, like, uh, well, there's, there's not really any scriptures that describe them the same way as they describe God. 
and I just showed you that in Psalms, in an equivalent way, right? The, the same way with the same words, probably. Do you take that to be equivalence? No, no, I think that Jesus Christ is equivalent to King David. Is that what you're asking? Like the use of the same term alone establishes some sort of equivalence. So when Paul quotes from it, or whoever he was quotes from it, that means that uh, he's he's using it how it was not supposed to be used. I don't understand. Um, I'm. Please don't take this point as a point of no, debate. Yeah. I'm really just trying to help you understand no, yeah, yeah. how a lot of historic Christians have thought. Okay. The, the because, idea, I, because I don't, yeah. I, I'm not trying to speak down to you when I say this. No, 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 this, no fine. This is the kind of stuff that I, I didn't have a, vocab, a very good vocabulary for just years ago. Um, it's called typology. I still don't have a vocabulary for it. It's okay. Like, I, I'm not trying to win the debate by putting not, this out. Yeah, not, it's, not my goal there, it's called typology. It's that not just figures of speech, but persons and events in redemptive history are designed by God to point beyond themselves to Christ. So uh, the classic example is that when Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, when you trace out the path of his life, what it looks like is it's the path of Israel. Uh, he is the Son of God. Israel was called the Son of God. Jesus is Son in the way Israel isn't. But Jesus exemplifies the way Israel ought to have been. Jesus, in a sense, is the true Israel. Uh, Jesus did what Adam ought to have done. Uh, J Jesus is a second Adam. Uh, J Jesus is a kind of a, a better replay of the events of the Old Testament and the people of the Old Testament showing that they crystal, like um, uh, uh, Jesus says, something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than, someone greater than Solomon is here. Solomon himself, or uh, the book of Proverbs, for example, when you, um, I'll, I'll miss with the, hand it back off to you. When I read Proverbs to my children, what I'm doing is priming them for the person of Jesus. Jesus is um, wisdom incarnate. Uh, Jesus is the actual uh, ultimate giver of wisdom. So when I learn Proverbs and when I teach it to my children, that is priming them so that when they hear Jesus, the ultimate wisdom teacher say, the Sermon on the Mount, it, their ears are attuned to where that ultimately comes from, that is the very person of Jesus. Yeah, and that was the original understanding of all the scriptures that talk about Israel being the Son of God, all the scriptures that talk about the Davidic King being Elohim, that's the same. The consistent understanding that traditional followers of Jesus Christ have always kept to and held. That the Old Testament points to the person of Jesus in and through the very events of people of the Old Testament. So but, when, and so the road the to Emmaus. These, when the authors wrote these texts, they had Jesus Christ in mind all the way and not the Davidic kings. Um, well, I, the, the term for it, if you wanted to Google sort of the discussion around this. No, I, I, yeah, you just said the term. I, can, I can do that. The term is theological interpretation. Um, or uh, forgive my bad Latin. It's, it's like sensu, uh, si, it's um, sensus plural. I forget the, the Latin term for it. The idea there's a, f a full sense of scripture um, that the human author can't contain in his mind. But the idea is that the word of God, that, that as these prophets are carried along by the Holy Spirit, uh, God himself is inspiring them with a divine intentionality and a, and a meaning that is grounded in and uh, rooted in and extending the human authorial intent. But there's more, uh, there's more in mind than the human author himself even can kind of wrap his head around. I'll give you a real clear example. Yeah, I, I follow you. Genesis 3.15. I, I'm, I'm recording too, so... No, 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 it, yeah. You're, yeah, you're totally fine. You're, yeah, feel free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God, uh, when he's cursing the serpent, uh, evidently in the audience of Adam and Eve, he gives a promise that someday the serpent would be crushed by the offspring, yeah. even though he would bruise the offspring. So when Moses is, is delivering this, it's not necessarily that he has a crystal clear picture of who the offspring is. He, he kind of sees it from afar, right? So there's a sense in which God has a more cl clear picture of who the offspring is. And when you get past the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is given to God's people, they can kind of do a second pass a second reading, a second round through uh, Genesis. And when you get to Genesis 3.15, you're like, oh, the, the offspring is Jesus. That, and it's, it's, no, it's not necessarily that Moses had um, a crystal clear photorealism of who Jesus would be or the, who the offspring would be. He knew it uh, analogically. He knew it meaningfully. But we now, as post-cross, post post-Pentecost, spirit-indwelled Christians... I can go back and read Genesis 3.15 and know 
with ever more certainty that that's talking about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate like 99% of what you said. I agree with it all the way. Your question was whether the Bible speaks of David the same way it speaks of Christ, right? Not by equivalence, but by analogy. I know, but that was your question, right? Because that was the criteria for what an Elohim is. There, that's, that's what we were originally talking about. I think maybe my point was there's certain superlative, extreme, categorically unique statements about God that are not made of David or not made of any other figure. So, for example, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. There's no other figure in the Bible spoken of like that. No, nobody even comes close or even possibly okay. close to that. And so uh, back to what we were originally talking about, you're saying that those verses teach that to be a Christian, it's required that you believe that God was not a sinner. Is that? Well, I'm making the observation there has never been a Christian that has believed God may be sinned. Uh, as a, as a, per your criteria of Christian, sure. Uh, uh, the historic per, Christian position okay, per the that's criteria, unanimous. For the criteria of the Bible, like what is the, what is the criteria to be a Christian from the Bible? To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ substantially and not merely superficially. Okay, so what does that mean, substantially and not superficially? To, to repent uh, and not be an idolater, but to look to God as okay, the most so high God. Okay, so why do they say in the past thought that God was a sinner? Is that not what they're, could, you, could they not fit under that criteria? They, that would be idolatry. It would not be the same God. Right. So, then, so then I asked you where in the Bible that that doctrine is contained, right? And so uh, Revelation 4.8. So it says, like, it doesn't say that God was never a sinner. It says that he was holy, right? Holy, holy, holy yeah, is the Lord God Almighty who... And we're who, commanded to be holy in Leviticus. Right. So we're, we're even supposed to be that way. Can you see, though, the difference? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's not true of you. That never will be true of you. No, because of my Savior, Jesus Christ, it will be true of me. Probably not for you, though, because we have a different Jesus. Because well, you don't believe that you can actually become righteous or be holy, like we're commanded to. That's not true. In the Old Testament. I'll never be able to say that I've always been holy. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'll, I'll, would, I'll be able to say, amazing well. grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I'll never rightly and properly be able to say to others, I've never been a wretch and I've never been forgiven and I've never received grace. The, the way that the new, that. the way the New Testament speaks of grace is that it, it disables me from being able to properly boast. I can't boast in myself. I can only boast in God. That's I agree with that. Categorically different from God, who can rightly boast in himself as, as never having received grace, as never having received forgiveness, as never having sinned, as being the Most High, as only ever having been the giver and never receiving something he didn't already have. That there's things about God that are celebrated of him, you could say boasted of him, that I can never boast about of myself. For example, that, that I've always been holy. I, I can never properly boast in myself of that. Neither can you. So you're, so you're suggesting that those verses in the Bible mean that God was never a sinner. That's like yeah. what they mean. I thought okay. you had agreed with that in some sense. I, that, that I agree with that does not mean that Latter-day Saints who have believed them in the past are not Christians. I don't understand the criteria. Just because to be clear. It's based on this, it's based on this uh, Bible alone standard in the first place, but even from that viewpoint, I still, I still don't see God was not a sinner in the Bible. Maybe God is just blind in my eyes to not see that. Help me out, Dustin. Why do you believe God never was a sinner? I know that's the Ostler position, right? But why, what's the, in short, what's the framework or reasons for believing God never was a sinner? Discourse? Unpack that for me for a little bit, please. The same way that God got a body, or that Jesus Christ got a body, is how God the Father got a body. And when Jesus Christ got a body, he never sinned. Okay. Because he was God before he entered into, before he shed glory, before he emptied himself and came into life. And that same way that Joseph Smith is talking about in the King Father Discourse is what happened with God the Father. Probably except that he didn't perform an atonement, but that he's not been eternally God from all eternity because at once he emptied his glory. Now, the, Because of the incarnation, you're saying? Because of the okay. incarnation. Now, I know Christians are going to say, well, Jesus Christ is still fully God in the flesh. Yeah. Right? I, I understand and can appreciate that point. Joseph Smith seems to not understand that point. It's explicitly why he's saying that God wasn't God from all eternity. is because he shed all his glory and divineness. The fact that, you know, a lot of times when, when uh, patriarchs speak to Yahweh, they, the face shines. God emptied that from himself when he became man. Or I, that was Joseph Smith's understanding. Can I restate your point and you tell me if I understand your point? Sure. Your, your point, if I understand it, is that the King Follow Discourse isn't about how God came to be God, but rather it's about how God It's not came, either. It's about, it's about how God solace. came to have a body. Well, it's about, how, it's fi about finding solace and the fact that you'll live again. And he, te and he, tells, he teaches this doctrine 
four of those comforting states who have just lost uh, a member of their community. But to understand you correctly, it's not that God became God through progression, in your view, I understand it. It's rather that God has always been God, and then he descended, condescended to have a body, took a body, and then temporarily was not God through that interim period. That's what period. Joseph Smith thought. I don't okay. know if I would fully ag agree with like the theology behind that. Uh, so, I can still appreciate it, but that's probably what he meant, or he's contradicting himself in the next paragraph by saying that you suppose God has been God from all eternity. Um, and then he says, uh, it is correct enough, but who told you that? And he could, continues and riffs off that. And so if he's, if, if we're going to be consistent with the amalgamage King Follett discourse, we should probably pick the one that's most consistent, the interpretation that's most consistent with the rest of the sermon, and not just read the, you imagine and suppose that God has been all, God from all eternity, I'll refute that idea, take away the veil so you may see. You yeah. should probably read it consistently with the rest, with the rest of the sermon. So, so that's the reading I choose. So if I understand you correctly, in a sense, he was God from God. He was God from all eternity until this event where he took a body. And, right. Emptied his glory. And so, and he wasn't fully divine in that sense. And then it was again later after his ascension. He resurrected that, okay. Himself. So if I understand you, just zooming back out or re rewinding, if I understand you correctly, Heavenly Father never was a sinner because he followed that pattern. And in that pattern, he was always God and never a sinner either prior God, to incarnation God or at the incarnation. To the law. I know the Latter-day Saint uh, interpretation of the Book of Mormon where the law precedes God. I know you talked about to, about that with mm -hmm. me before. If God is the orbiter of the law and his nature is that to... I'm sorry, orbiter? If if he is the... Uh, Originator maybe? Or no, no, no. Author? Or? Yeah, author is the same thing. Uh, I just speak. I just forgot my okay. consonant in that word. If God is the author of the law, anything God does is that is the law. That is the standard because he is the most high. He is more intelligent than they are, like the DNC in the book of Abraham say. He sits in the, among the council of gods, being the most high, being at the head of the council of all the other gods. So he wouldn't be a sinner in that capacity? and that, That's if the logic? Is, if, he, if he is the author of the law, how could he sin? Okay. So, and to supplement that point, just so I understand you correctly, the verses in the Bible that speak of him having been holy, 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 who was and is and is to come, those... That, no, that, 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 that hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You have your own as well. Let me ask you a question. The Bible alone. I'm just asking you. A, a verse like Revelation 4 8, as previously quoted, if I understand you correctly, that does not suffice to establish that God never sinned. Is that fair? I'm just, I'm just trying yeah, to understand yeah, it. It doesn't matter if it's under mine or your theology. That verse does not suffice to say that God was never a sinner, period, under any sort of theology. On the book of Revelation alone. I don't know. Do you think that the Bible is sufficient to make a case that Heavenly Father never was a sinful mortal? No. That's, that was my whole point. No. Okay. That's why I was asking you about that. Okay, so... That's why I asked you why it was a criteria for someone to be a true Christian. Uh, they have to believe that God was never a sinner. Yeah, it's, that's built into the very definition of... I mean the Father, the person of the Father. Not the... Of all three persons of the Trinity. Uh, uh, I'll, so I'll make the a... Trinity is not in the Bible, so again, we can, we can like... That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking about specifically God the Father. If we can formulate the Trinity if you want to, but it's not. The, the, it's not the two, you could call them creeds. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So and, the and, then, then the, and then sort of the, the creed or the confession, Jesus is Lord. To say that God is one. So what does God is one mean? To say that God is one. What does that mean? To say that God is one. I, I don't want to build off their pre, your false presupposition. I want to understand what God is one. You're learning from Travis Anderson no, here. No, I learned it from the NRSV Oxford Study Bible is where I learned it from. No, I'm talking about true. a mode of communication. So, no, I want you to let me take a little bit of the case and hand it back off to you. You build your own no, case. No, no, you're building off this presupposition that is false. And you're gonna, we're, if, we, if we start wrong, we're going to end wrong. Take so let's, well, let's talk what, about what you can do. presuppositions and our differences. Well, in, in, in this, in this you can take my presupp you're about to give me about. Take about, my presuppositions and my conclusions. So what does God as one mean? Take my presuppositions in my conclusions in a package and then critique it. No, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Well, then that's, that's just bad. That. That's just bad conversational uh, lack of patience. I, I mean, whether or not what you believe is a bad conversational patience is, is really irrelevant. Kind of, kind of jumping on people without letting them finish their thoughts is a kind of rhetorical domineering aggression okay. that I don't think represents when, the typical Latter-day Saint yeah, on the street so when, here. Yeah, so when people start, you know, telling me that, you know, oh, I'm arrogant. I am arrogant. That's, I know, I know. But when, when people start, you know, going to me, how I'm going about this conversation, it shows me that they're losing the conversation. I don't. So let's let's I, I, talk about what God. I'm is okay losing, but I, I I want this to be substantial and patient, 
and diligent. I, I don't want it to be I, a kind of a... And I want to be diligent too. And so when you hand me this package, wrap, pre-formulated doctor to be so I can critique mm -hmm. it, that's such a waste of time. No, let's 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 take the ingredients out of that and talk about each one because we're just going to sit here. We have th two different packages, and so let's talk about what God is one means because you're going to use it and build this whole theology. I'm, out of I'm so only willing to give that. this in a small package to you. You can take it or leave it. I, okay. It only takes me 30 seconds. When I say that God is one with Israel, and when I say that Jesus is Lord with with Christians, that language is not infinitely flexible. It contains meaning. Yeah, it does. And, you're, and so, and you're, and what you think wrapping that thought up, I'm, what I'm doing as a Christian... It is at odds with the scholarship of the Bible. Yeah, yeah, slow down. I'm, I'm happily confessing that God is one and that Jesus is Lord. I can confess that all day. That's what... The, uh, your your, your but understanding it, yeah, it's is not, correct. It's not a mere semantic or superficial confession. It's a substantial confession Yeah, it's when you got your, your ideas and your theology inject, falsely injected into it, that you've had your uh, teachings, your seminaries, have told you what it means, like you're suggesting that that's what my church has done for some reason. When I'm telling you that's not the case, according to Oxford University, I'm telling you that's not the case. That they say what? So that's why I asked you what does God mean, or what does God as one mean? We can talk about that. That's, I know. Let's but, talk about it. But I confess that as a beautiful truth, as an essential truth, and I might call it a communal belief shared by all Christians. I so I, it's not a mere intellectual, I'm not, I'm not trying to be fun a part idea. Of your club. I don't want to be a part of your club. Well, I don't, I don't, you don't want me to be a part of your club. I do, actually. So when you say, I do, actually. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, okay, Justin, I really God, do. Your Calvinist God is for predestined me to not be a part of your club. I don't know that. No, I, I know that. Okay, I know that. I, I, I would want to uh, invite you in with the clear boundary maintenance. I'd, I'd want you to join Christians in confessing that God is one and that Jesus is Lord with the same essential substance of meaning to that. Yeah, so that's not what I'm really asking you. I'm, I'm telling you that your understanding of God is one is at odds with scholarship on the Bible. I don't care that that's what all your Christian friends believe. That's what the historic Christianity believes. As this serves no relevance to me because scholarship is increasing. We're learning more. And I'm telling you that I didn't learn this from Travis Anderson or from the group of Travis Anderson, whatever you said. I learned this from my NRSV Oxford yeah, I was linking you to Travis Anderson, not with the content of speech, but with the mode of speech, with the sort of the conversational aggression. Oh, okay. And not, not, and not the content. Right, right. It was, it was more about the sort of the aggressive sort of interruption. Okay. I, I, I don't think that represents the typical Latter-day Saint or even most LDS I'm not, apologists I'm we not, talk I don't to. represent LDS apologists. I don't represent the Latter-day Saint church. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't represent the Osler rights, whatever you said. I'm not, I'm representing myself. You would I want, I mean, it, just person to person neighbor to neighbor, it seems like intuitively, though, you'd want to represent your community well, though. I, I'm not representing my community. Un, unavoidably, you are, even if you don't want to. Okay, you can, that's fine for you to think that. That's great. I want to talk about why God is one. I want to talk about what that means. Because I so when I, when I talk about what it means for God to be one, I can't but help with desire to speak with Christians, not from my own opinions. I want to speak from the authority of Scripture okay, with Christians. let's talk about the authority of Scripture. Let's talk about it. What does God as one mean? I will, well, I'm going to confess with Christians that God is uniquely self-existent, that He is uniquely, um, how would you put it? He's so you not don't contingent. Really want to talk about it. I do. Yeah, but well, give me a give me a minute to unpack it. Okay, I'm happy to hand me the pre-wrap, you know, message yeah. package. I'm I'm happy to talk about it. How about this? Let's let's set some ground rules. Give me a minute to unpack it, and I'll give you a minute to unpack it. I don't, I don't want a minute to unpack it. I want your understanding of what God is one means. Yeah. So you keep telling me Can this. Can I answer you for a minute and then allow you to answer your position for a minute? Okay. I'm not trying to, this isn't a, like, this isn't a, a, a winning, losing thing. Uh, okay. So that, that God is one means that he is not defined by something outside of himself. Uh, I'm human. Can you say that again? He's not defined by something ultimately outside of himself. His, his, his being, his essence is self-referential. I am that I am. I am, right? So when, when we think about who God is, he's not in a class of beings. He's a member of or in the class of. He is the great I am. I am that I am. So he is uniquely self-existent, uh, uniquely simple. He's not in a class of, with other beings. His essence and existence are, are shared. Are, they're, they're one. Um, he is uniquely worthy of worship, and he's uniquely free. So he's holy, he's free, he's simple, he's ultimate, he's transcendent, uh, and he's not uh, a member of a kind of society of other 
uh, beings that are defined by a class. Rather, he is the great I am. Okay, so you've injected all of that into um, what it means to be God is one, right? When I look at the rest of script, the rest of scripture is helping me unpack that statement. Okay, okay. So just in that rest of scripture you're talking about, you're just not including the Gospel of John. Well, the Gospel of John would be all 66 books okay. should be consulted to unpack what that means. Scripture, okay. scripture interprets Scripture. But first, I want to hear from you. What do you think it means for God to be one? No, I just I'm, I, I still want to understand some of the things that you said. I want to unpack those things. So, the God is one, right? Jesus, the Father, one. All the way, right? Yes. Right? Yes. You already know where I'm going. Not right? as a society, but as a so, simple being. Okay, so then you're suggesting that John 17 contradicts the understanding? No. No. Okay, so the same way that we are supposed to be one with Jesus Christ is how Jesus Christ is one with the Father, right? The yeah. same way. In the context, right. as... So what as, is the context of all the Gospel of John with Jesus let me, and God being let me, uh, let me respond. The, the, the meaning and context of John 17, as I understand it, is that there is a mutual indwelling, that the Father dwells in the Son, the Son dwells in the Father, and that this is true... That's not what you told me. That's not what you told me. When I asked you what God is one means, you went on this... I'm so sorry. I thought you were quoting... Um, I had made reference to the Exodus account where God's... Where the, what, sorry, Deuteronomy. I'm so sorry if I'm conflating. Right. We had made reference to that earlier, so I yep, thought that's... Shema. When I think about the statement, Hero is where the Lord our God, the Lord is one, when I start unpacking that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, like you said, Scripture interprets Scripture, right? Mm -hmm. So we should probably use John to help us understand that text, too. Eventually, I even, yeah. I even appeal to the Oxford... Uh, NRS, the Oxford Bible that that I was telling you about too. But if you're saying, if you're suggesting that Scripture interprets Scripture, mm -hmm. you know, not whatever that means, then shouldn't we use Jesus saying that he's one with the Father this same way that he's, one, that he's supposed to be one of his disciples? He also says in John 17 that as the Father sent me, I send you. So I'm going to ask you, Dustin. Yeah. Is that the language of equivalence? Yes, I would say yes. Yes. So are we? I believe in a premortal life. I would say yes. So are we sent as only begotten sons? As monogenes, that we are each unique. I don't see why that would pose an issue. So are, were you sent in the exact same way that Jesus was sent? To for, perform for, the atonement, or mm -hmm. no, no? Right. So there you go. So I, I'm making I'm making a point here. In John 17, it says, "As the Father sent me, I send you." That shows me that there's an analogy here that's not exact equivalence. Because we all, I think we both agree, actually, but both substantially agree, that there's a sense in which Jesus was sent that we're not sent. So it's a limited, it's a limited connection. He was born of a virgin. He was born to be an atoning sacrifice. He was sent as the only begotten son. Okay. I don't want to yell at you over a siren, sir. You were saying there's a way in which he was sent as the only begun? That we weren't. Yeah, yeah. So when he says, as the Father sent me, I send you, it's by analogy. There, there's connect, there's okay. meaningful connection so, there so, that's not equivalent. Yeah, yeah. So John 17, the, the, that prayer is an analogy. That language is an, an, an analogical. Okay. So there's a sense in which the Son is sent that we are sent also. But there's also, and when we zoom out to the rest of Scripture, even by Latter-day Saint standards, there's a sense in which Jesus was sent that we're not sent. There's, there's dissimilarity and there's similarity. So the language can be used to establish the link, the connection, uh, the shared features. But it doesn't get you all the way to we're born of virgins, uh, we're only begotten children, uh, we're, a, we're an atoning sacrifice. So I would, here's, my, here's my bigger argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take that example in John 17, as the Father sent me, I sent you, and apply that same sort of framework onto the oneness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then the in this life, oneness of the, the believers who are living out the gospel um, in, in the upper room discourse, I think it was a John 13 to John 17. In the upper room discourse, the whole idea is that as the Father dwells in the Son and as the Father and the Son dwell in God's people, there's a mutual indwelling there. As they live that out by the Holy Spirit, there's a unity, there's a oneness that is presented to the rest of the world that shows that we are of God, that shows that we're loved by God, that shows that we belong to Jesus. Yeah. Um, so for the, 
for the when God, uh, sorry, when Jesus Christ says the how the Father sent Him, the same way He'll send the apostles. I want to read that specifically. Please do. Where is that at? I just, I just, where is it at? That's what I'm asking. Is it the end of John 17? Uh, it's here. Yeah. Give the delay. I'm going to use Google to find the exact That's fine. That's totally first, and then I'm going to zero in on with my edge. With my... Uh, As the Father sent me... Oh, I was wrong. It's John 20, verse 21. That's fine. That is sent by a word. It's there. We have not believed your eyes, girl with four dollars. Did I say 2021? Yeah, yeah, 2021. Yeah, forgive me, I, I mislocated that. That's not in John 17. No, that's, I think there's something similar in 17, here. actually. If you give me a second to just skim. Maybe we say this great of stuff. Maybe, or we decided to be with you. Let's say that. that. I mean, I'll, I'll let you find that verse, but you're suggesting that when, when Jesus Christ says that in, in 2021, mm -hmm. that um, as the Father sent me, even so I send you, I mean, the shows. language is pretty different in John 17 for the oneness of God. The it's a language of comparison, the as language. No, it, no, it's a little deeper than that. If you go and read verse 21. It's sure. In, in, of 17. Would you like to read 17 out loud with me in a second? Sure. 20 verse 21 to begin with, though. Sure. Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. Oh, you're reading that first? Sorry. Yeah, my bad. Um, okay, yeah. going back to 17. All right, let's buckle up. Father, the hour has come. Oh, right, where are you starting? Verse 1. Okay. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you gave him authority over all flesh, that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on earth, by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that, you have now they know that everything you have given me is from you because I have given them the words you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but I am praying for those, you have, for those you have given me because they are yours. Everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine and I am glorified in, in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them is lost, except the son of de destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may, they may have joy, that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of this world, not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them, so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me. I must pause there. Let's pay special attention here. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us 
so that the world may believe that you sent me, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am, I am in them and you are in me, so that they may be completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and, they, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you have loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known, and you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may also be, may be in them and I may be in them. Yeah, so it's a mere comparison. There are, you have to unpack that. Yeah. Sorry. So like, yeah, so when you're suggesting that we should use John 20, 21 to interpret these verses, that Jesus Christ saying the same way Father has sent me, I send my apostles, that same kind of comparison is being made here. It's not of unlimited equivalence, even by LDS standards. So, um, you, that's not really what I asked. You won't be a no, member of I the asked, Godhead in this yes, life. A yes or no question is what I asked. But, okay. So, in, in reality, well, I don't want to evade it. Re ask it, and I'll try to better answer it. No, it's, no, so this is just a mere like, comparison, just as John 20 20. It is, an, it is a drawing comparison, it's not an unlimited equivalence. Okay. Even so, by your own standards. So when he says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that's a, that is a mere comparison. Well, first of all, uh, notice what I, I mentioned earlier, the mutual indwelling. I, so the in language, the in, I, in, you, yeah, the you, and the same way Christ is in the Father is how the apostles should be, not just in the Father, but also in Jesus Christ. Right, in this life. Yep. So that the world can see. Yes. And so, and so... This is a mere comparison. This is, this is like, this is not to a... Uh, I don't become a member of the Godhead in this life. Neither do you believe that. I'm not, I'm not talking about what I believe. I'm asking about what you believe concerning these verses. Your, your beliefs are on the table here as well. Okay. That's not, I know what else. Okay. I can talk. Right? So by Latter-day Saint standards, you this is not... You appealing to Latter-day Saint standards when I'm here to talk about your religion. But I'm doing this in contradistinction. Uh, for, for purposes of clarity, and, and I don't want there to be a pretended so sort of... for purposes of clarity, let's yeah. talk about how this is a, a, a mere comparison, just like John twenty twenty one is. Right. There are things about the oneness that share features. There's an extension or an analogy there. There's a comparison there. The oneness shared and the oneness extended. The oneness inherent to God and the oneness shared by His people. The oneness that is natural to the Father and the Son... And, and that's, that, is, uh, that was already so, and the oneness that God's people participate in so that the world knows that they're sent by God. Okay, so, so when Peter tells us to be partakers of the divine nature... Exa the great, great analogy. Kind, the kind of oneness, right? The, we, we partake in something. We have to partake in it. God doesn't become that by partaking. We partake. Okay, if I partake in sin, am I a sinner? Can we pause for a second? No, no, if I partake in sin, am I a sinner? Um, by normal rhetorical standards. Yeah. So if yeah. I partake in divine, what does that mean for me? It, well, it doesn't mean... You, great. Let's talk about that. But can we pause and make sure we're wrapping up John 17? Sure. Okay. I, I don't want to evade or uh, endlessly shelve the, yeah, the, the, the Petrine passage. Okay. Um, but the oneness here, even in Latter-day Saint frameworks, is not of unlimited equivalence. Because there is still, even by Latter-day Saint standards, a oneness that the Father and the Son share that you don't share. Aaron, I'm talking about your beliefs. No, we're going to keep the Latter-day Saint faith on the table in contradistinction to the historic Christian faith. Because even by Latter-day Saint, standard, Latter Saint, Latter Saint standards, that's not exact equivalence. The I'm oneness not language... I'm represent the, the Latter-day Saint faith. I'm not. You are a Latter-day Saint. You're here to represent, though, right? Your church. You'd, be, you'd feel comfortable saying that. I want to, as best as I can, represent yeah, historical I Christianity. So I, I, so I don't... I, I wouldn't claim that for myself? You so, should, though. Okay. You, thank you for... Yeah, there's a criteria on the Bible that I should represent historic Christianity. You should aim to represent your community okay, and your history. You, no, you have no... You should aim to represent the LDS authority. faith. Okay, so... E either be a Latter-day Saint or be a secular deconstructionist... Daniel McClellan style. So you right? don't get to decide that for me. 
my relationship with my God is none of your concern. It is. I, I can no, call you on the no, carpet. It's, not. List. It's, it's, it's none of your concern. It's not. Why not? I don't need you to define my relationship with God. You have no authority to do that. You're, you, you, don't, you, don't, you, can't, you don't make sense. You're not being consistent with these texts. You've, you've told me that these texts right here, that this precious intercessory prayer of Jesus Christ is a mere comparison, and, I, and, and that's how I'm supposed to take it. There's a oneness so, and a sharedness and an analogy there, and there's a, a oneness, connection. A oneness and deity, which you, which you reject. Which you reject, which is clearly taught, which, which you reject, but that's okay. I'm willing to reason with you, but I think you're, I think you're trying to be domineering here. I, I, I don't care how you are perceiving me. I, it, you I should, at to some level. That's part of being a neighbor. I mean, to care what people think is not an ultimate concern, but it is an intermediate concern. To be courteous, to be kind, to repent when, when you overextend, that's part of good okay. interfaith dialogue. Yeah. So, are you courteous and kind, then, when you uh, come to my temple? Or to the, I'm not, to the I'm not in the church. temple. I'm not on a public so, domain sidewalk. So, yeah, when you come to the public domain sidewalk of the walkway of the temple to try and convert uh, Christians into an apostate, nonsensical uh, Christianity. I don't. Sorry. When you come here to do that, is that, that, for me, I don't care how you perceive that. For me, that's unkind. So what it unkind. shows me, though, is that you're here in, in part as a, as a member of this community. You're speaking. I'm a member of this community, but I don't speak for them at all. And I'm sure that I'm sure half the things that I said today, I would, I would like. There's a Latter Day Saint who I believe is will be saved, who disagrees with that. So I, I hope this will lodge in your mind, and you'll remember this. You may not speak for your community, but you should speak with your community. Yeah, it's not going to be lodged in my mind. It's not because it's just not true, and I don't. I don't claim to. You should I don't want to. seek to speak in unity with the Latter Day Saint faith. Okay. It's, what, theology is not a solo free enterprise of idiosyncratic do-it-yourself uh, project. To do theology is to do theology necessarily under some sort of authority so in community church, with other people. Does my church tell me that its members to do theology? Not by that language, but essentially to think about things. Okay, to think about things is the same the thing. The glory of God is intelligence? Yeah, there, there isn't a... That's not what that means. It's being dishonest. Well, what well, does intelligence mean in that context? Part of the substance of that... Okay, there's no answer. Okay. Well, part of the substance of that is to think deeply and to, to conform yourself to truth wherever it can be found and to do that, uh, ultimately to do that in, in unity with your own community. Not To do that, it's both individual and communal. You are a member of a church and you're an individual. Okay. You, are, you are in a community and you're an individual. So it matters whether or not you're speaking against your church. To you, it does. It matters to your own church. It matters, it matters to your matters own community. It matters to God. This, it matters to me? It matters biblically for saints to, be, to seek unity with God's people. So if, if you claim to be of God's people, you should s seek a kind of unity with your, with, with yeah. your own pr prophetic tradition, with your own uh, community. So even yeah, if you... So, yeah, so you as a person who... Uh, a, believe in Jesus Christ all the way, should seek unity with his prophets. That's, that's I mean... I in principle, yeah. Amen. Yes. Living prophets. I, if I had living prophets other than Jesus, I ought There's to no seek unity with them. Jesus, well, we could talk about that, but the bigger point here that we're on, the sort of the, the, the original point here is that to be a Christian, I want to be in unity with... I want to be under the authority of God's word, and I want to speak as best I can in unity with God's people. Both. I'm speaking as best I can in unity with the text given. But does it matter to you whether you are in unity with your own prophetic tradition? Your own what prophets is, and apostles. What prophetic tradition mean? What your leaders have taught. So the prophetic tradition is that the prophets and apostles have disagreements in theology and they debate each other and the church makes official stances and it also says things that it doesn't matter what you believe in this case. That's my tradition. So I, I fit into that paradigm. I don't... So if you took a position that your leaders spoke to and you agreed with them, you would want to speak at least to some partial unity with your leaders where they have agreed with you, right? Okay, so what's an example of... Uh, I mean, that is a real question. Like, when you take a position that agrees with at least some of your prophets and apostles, you should want to speak in unity with them, right? That's not a gotcha question. It's just a, a softball. Um, yeah, I don't... Yeah. I don't... Yeah, so it's not, it's not just obvious, Dustin. Right? Yes, exactly. It, you should want to speak with other Latter-day Saints, yeah, especially authorities that them. share your... Exactly, but you should want to speak with them. And this is where uh, LDS apologetics, I think, needs to do a little bit of a, uh, of a course correction. 
This okay. isn't about your free, free solo enterprise, do-it-yourself kind of project. That's totally what I'm doing, but yeah. Well, I mean, where your leaders have, prophets and apostles have spoken to an issue, you should speak at least consciously with them, not for them, but with them, and at least where they've contradicted you or where they've disagreed with you, at least be conscious of the fact. So when they tell me to well, go that's the case. study, like you just said, to think things through, yeah. and I actually do that, how am I at odds with that? What are you talking about? When I actually go and I study theology, this is the, 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 the Bible's actually just contradictory. I don't, it, you, you haven't found that out yet. But, but well, when, so when I go and do that and I go and study, how am I then at odds with, with what my prophets and apostles are teaching? Let's take that as an example. If you have a particular passage in the Bible that you think is contradictory, you should ask yourself, have my... It is contradictory, but go ahead. Well, also ask yourself, have your leaders found this passage contradictory? They, my leaders have told me that there are contradictions in the Bible, so why would I not expect... But, have they, but when they've spoken to the passage that you speak on... They haven't. When they do... Okay. When they do speak with us to the same passage, it should be a, a part of the impetus of LDS apologetics to lean on, appeal to, speak in unity with your own leaders. Okay, so when my own leaders point out a contradiction, what am I supposed to do with that? Speak in unity with them. Okay. It, take your faith seriously. Own it. You're yes. kind of suggesting that my leaders don't do that. Well, I'm suggesting that LDS apologists tend to be detached from LDS prophets and apostles. They, Sorry, no, I, didn't, okay. I didn't hear what you said. I don't have that. I don't have that similar experience. I don't understand what you mean. Um, well, the King Fall discourse would be a good example. Is, is um, you know, if you're going to take a, posi- a certain kind of reading of the King Fall discourse. Yeah. Fault so discourse. what is so? For example, let's finish the thought. Is, hold on. Hold on. No. 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 Let's not do that. When, no. Let's do that. No. Let's do that. When you what take is the church position. I, I don't want to be. I don't want to play the aggression game. I don't. I don't. I don't want to play that either. But you're you're building off again a false presupposition. What is the official I church stance on the King Fall discourse? Let me finish the thought. When you take a position on how to read the King Fall Discourse, you should have in mind how your own prophets and apostles have interpreted the King Fall Discourse. It should be a variable. It should be on the table. So then what is the church's use and stance on the King Fall Discourse? The church, there's not a single, there's not an exclusive Okay, position. then why do I have to be exclusive on that too? What are you talking about? Well, where your leaders agree with you, you should speak in unity with them. And where they disagree with you, you should be self-conscious and open about that. I am totally open about that. Okay, well, good. We should integrate it into the conversation. I don't speak for them. But you should speak with them. If you have real prophets and apostles... And when they tell me to go, to go study it out and research, I'm speaking with them. That's what I'm doing. Well, I mean, on the content. I, when Latter-day Saint apologists take a position that is not shared, a particular position that's not shared by... Latter-day Saint so when prophets. they find out new No, no, I want to finish the sentence. I know you do. I know you do. I'm, I'm aware of that as I speak. But when they find a position that's, that's new, and, and, like, so for example, the, the, the DNA thing with the Book of Mormon, and they, the apologists find out that the Nephites, or sorry, that the, that the Native Americans don't have 100% Jewish DNA, what, 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 are the, what does the church do? What does the church do? Keep talking. I'm asking you, what, is the, what did the church do? No, you, you know. You know, right? I'm not certain. They changed the intro to the Book of Mormon, right? I'm willing to dialogue okay, with you. Okay, so when the, when the scholars so you just wanna, disagree. If you just want to talk, you can talk. Okay, which, you just, you've been, which you was, you were able to do a lot. But So when the scholars disagree with the leadership of the church, whatever that means, what is, in the past, what is the leadership of the church shown to do in those cases? They changed the intro to the Book of Mormon a couple times. So, so why should I expect anything different from what I'm doing? I shouldn't. I shouldn't. And your, and your criteria of, of telling me how I should and what, how and what I should worship, it's not up to you. It's up to God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Your Calvinist presupposition, baby God, if he exists, has predestined me to be this way. Okay? Justin, do you want to have a dialogue or do you just want to kind of do a sermon and, and, and wrap things up? I, I mean, I've asked you a couple questions and you just didn't answer. You could have continued the conversation, but you didn't. But I, I think you're following in the tradition of Travis Anderson of being a, of not wanting people to complete their thoughts. Yeah, I don't want you to build an idea off of a false presupposition because if we start wrong, we'll end wrong. You, which is a quote from the but there, There's right? a basic courtesy, though, in allowing people to complete a thought. Okay, a basic courtesy is, uh, is, um, is, is that in the Bible? To be courteous to all, yeah. Okay, but the basic Paul says courtesy that. of letting people finish, like there's no one ever cuts anyone off in the Bible. That's just not that. that's just common sense application. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, Justin, you, Justin, you, I don't want to, I don't want to 
rhetorically battle with you. I don't want to have a uh, an aggressive rhetorical I know, back and forth. I know that's you. great. I appreciate that. I it's, that's great. I don't care. I just don't. You're here to convert the members of my church, and I, as long as you are doing that, I will be a disturber and annoyer to that. That's totally fine. Is that the capacity in which you're here? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Just like DNC seventy one tells me. What's that say? It says to go in public and private to your. Uh, Can we read it? Yes, for sure. Would you like me to do uh, a phone uh, flashlight? No, I can see. Uh, if you, if I don't, if you need it, that's totally fine. Like, go for it. Okay. Um, so, behold, thus saith the. It's very short. It's eleven verses. It's, but I think it's, it's, it's going to give it context because people are uh, think that this is specifically to Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon, but it's a specific verse that makes that not true. Behold, thus saith the Lord unto my servants, Joseph Smith Jr. and Sidney Rigdon, at the time. The time has verily come that it is necessary and expedient that you should open your mouths in proclaiming my gospel, that the, the things, um, sorry, I lost my mind, the things of the kingdom, expounding mysteries thereof out of the scriptures, according to that portion of the spirit and power which shall be given you, even as I will. Verily I say unto you, proclaim unto the word in reasons round about, and in the church also, for the space of a season, even until it shall be made known unto you. Verily this is a mission for a season which I give unto you. Wherefore, labor ye diligently in my vineyard, call upon the inhabitants of the earth, and bear record, and prepare ye the way of the commandments and revelations which are to come. Now behold, this is wisdom. Whoso readeth, let him understandeth, and receive also. Word, verse very important. For unto him that receiveth it shall be given more abundantly even power. Wherefore, confound your enemies, call upon them to meet with you, both in public and private, inasmuch, and inasmuch as ye are faithful, their shame shall be made manifest. Wherefore, let them bring forth their strong reasons against the Lord. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, There is no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper, according to Isaiah. And if any man lifteth his voice against you, he shall be confounded in mine own due time. Wherefore, keep my commandments, even they are true and faithful. Even so, amen. So, as I heard that, it sounds like you are commanded here to allow your religious enemies, I know you don't mean enemy in the, in the strongest of sense, but in some sense, to give their reasons. Yeah. So if you're going to obey this passage, by the way, I mean this 100% genuinely, I appreciate the boldness of Latter-day Saint proponents wanting to meet in a public place and discuss the big issues. Can we agree on that? Yeah. That's not a debate point. I, I really appreciate that. But it sounds like even according to this section of the DNC, Part of that is listening to someone make their case. Yeah, so you're saying that this is saying to not interrupt people. Is that what At least let them make their basic stated okay. case with reasons. Yeah. To, I, to give yeah, their reasons. Yeah, as you, I, you know, the same way you interpret Revelation about the Holy, Holy, Holy is the same way that you're going to interpret this. You're going to interject your own meanings and, and, not, and not say what it actually says. Which is when I let you uh, go case for case, give me a, a little package... That, that's not, is that not letting you so, bring your reasons? Honest question for you. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's a reasonable application of this section to just shut people down rhetorically and not allow, allow them to state their case? That, is that what I've done to you? Is that how you feel? At times. Yeah. Okay. I honest question. Down. Rhetorically, not through content merely, but through the rhetoric of sort of the aggressive interruptions of not allowing someone to complete their thoughts. If I've not allowed you to complete your thoughts, forgive me. I want to give you more space to do that. But it sounds like, according to your own scriptures, it sounds like according to the basic behavioral standards of your own yeah, so, community. So, Hold yeah. up. It sounds like there should be some threshold of a back and forth where you can state your reason that I can state my reasons. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, when you tell me things that like, oh, you're talking in the same manner as Travis Anderson, is that a complete thought that you're able to get across? To? By itself, yeah. Okay. So that's, just, that's at least one case where I was able to let you do that. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Yeah, you, you, I don't want to uh, demonize you as though you haven't allowed any of that. Yeah, I, I'm not saying you're the worst here or that you've only ever been bad about, bad about this. No. Okay. So we, we've had substantial dialogue in the past, right? We've had meaningful discussion in the past. Uh, this has been totally meaningful to me. I, I haven't felt like in the past this, it's been just an aggressive back and forth. I feel like we've been able to go back and forth substantially prior to okay. this. I feel right? differently, but okay. Okay. It seems like, though, it would represent the Latter-day Saint community best. 
If there's I'm a not representing the Latter Day Saint community, I don't represent the Latter Day Saint community. Sorry, waiting for the car sound. Oh, that's a motorcycle. I don't want to shout over it. Okay. Well, I mean, that that itself is an issue. I, I, maybe we could speak to that real quickly. Would you like to speak about that? Can we speak a little bit to that? Sure. What do you have to say? It's my responsibility as a Christian to try to obey God's word out of love for God and love for neighbor. And in that, to, to be mindful of the fact that even if I don't think of myself as representing the local Christian churches or the Christian community, I unavoidably uh, reflect on the Christian community. So I Yeah, that's just I, your understanding. I just have a different one. Well, I mean, I, I don't want Christ to have a bad name. I don't speak uh, for Christ as though... Uh, I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm over him or equal to him. But what I say, though, reflects upon him. And I don't want, I don't want Christ's name to be profaned through my bad behavior or my discourtesy. I've had to, I've had to repent before through uh, uh, my second debate with Kwaku. Just, I got super aggressive then. I, I, I don't think I was a good representative or a good example of a good debate or a, a dialogue partner there. But I should want to represent my, my Christian community really well. And I don't think it's mean or I don't think I'm not trying to trap you when I say I, I would hope for my Latter-day Saints to try to represent their own community well, not merely in the content of their speech, but in the manner of their speech. Again, my, I don't, I don't, not a, a singular Latter-day Saint doesn't represent our faith. I don't, like I just, I don't, I don't understand. I don't even understand how that's relevant to what we're talking about. I'm not. Because what, what we talk about is just as important as how we talk about it. Okay, so, I mean, have you, are you perceiving me as, like, trying to belittle you? Are you perceiving me like I'm, 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 I'm I don't, I don't understand. I Not at this saying. moment. Okay. No. And I, what, I what is an example of something I've done in the past that is perceived that way by you? In this conversation, when I was trying to talk about uh, how God is one, and how Jesus is Lord and how that's packaged together. I mean, you wanted to cut that off yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, I did. You failed to understand my perspective okay. uh, that to, to suggest that we should continue off the basis that God is one is a false start because everything you say after that is not only irrelevant, but also I'm not going to be paying attention to that because we started wrong. So let's go and, and fix this definition before we can build off of that. And so, and so, but, but, but. The same way I didn't respect you in continuing your pre-made message and a package for me, you didn't respect my idea that I think that we should talk about your presuppositions first. So let me give you an example. Just if someone were to make premise A, premise B, and then conclusion in a, in a 30 to 60 second manner, I think it would be better in general to then pause and say, well, then let's talk about premise A upon which your argument is based and then focus on that. that not, I found it extremely effective to not do that, especially in these kind of conversations. Well, there's a, there's a basic courtesy in just human interaction to a, allowing people to complete thought. That's the, that's the big idea. Yeah, I, I feel like you weren't able to allow me to complete my thought that we should stop there and focus on what God has wanted. Okay. Well, I don't want to interrupt you needlessly. I, I, don't, I know there's kind of an excited back and forth, but I, I, I really do think that when Travis Anderson was here, was it weeks ago, months ago? I have no idea. Yeah, um, that was a really poor example of Latter-day Saint behavior that is not representative of the typical Latter-day Saint we meet on the street. Latter-day Saints are a courteous and kind, almost conflict-avoidant kind of people. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that Travis would claim to represent the church either, but also we don't need your definitions on us. We don't need you to call us kind. I'm not asking to be part of your club. I'm not asking you to perceive me as kind. I, I, I don't understand this, this barrage you're going on where this is how Latter-day Saints should be when, when, when we, don't, we don't want to be a part of your club. Well, you claim the New Testament, right? We, what is claim the New Testament? What does that mean? It's part of your canon. Yes. So that the New Testament, Paul, talks about showing perfect courtesy to all people. Okay, and, and, and you're assuming that that, that is a, the exact equivalency, the word courtesy in English today as it was in Greek. I would hope that Latter-day Saints and Evangelicals could both at least pause and say, we both want to pursue a maturity in the presenting of courtesy. We want to grow in 
uh, neighborly courtesies in the way we interact. Okay. I would find non-controversial. Yeah, hopefully. yeah. So for sure. My subjective opinion is that I would find it courteous if you never came here again. That was that would be courteous to me. So do you see how that our interpretations of courteous are going to be a little bit differently? Yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. But I yeah we're going to be doing evangelism. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'm so so will I. Yeah. Yeah. So when we talk, you know maybe maybe going forward, maybe we just help to have ground rules. No. Yeah. no. Or guidelines. No, I mean, you're, you're, I mean you're giving me plenty of guidelines to follow. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you want to do now? Well, let's talk about uh, how, let's talk about the Trinity in the Bible. I know earlier when you talked about how uh, we're discussing on, um, and the, and the oneness, uh, how the Father and the Son are a part of this Trinity and they weren't a part of this Trinity. When you say a part of this Trinity, it made, it made it sound like that the, the Trinity was in the Bible, like substantially contained, but not explicitly yeah, expressed. Yeah, yeah. So I was, so I was just like, I don't. That's not. I don't understand how you could. I'll that. give you an example. Yeah. Um, in the, I think it's the early 20th century, Latter-day Saint thinkers taught a doctrine. Uh, I don't know when it was by this name, but at some point it was called divine investiture. Okay. I've never heard, heard of it. Of it. Uh, the idea is that. And forgive me if I'm misrepresenting this. This is to the best of my memory. Divine investiture, according to LDS thinkers, is the idea that the Son can uh, represent the Father almost in a, in a manner where he identifies himself as the Father. Yeah, I know. I think we still believe that to a certain extent. I think that there's people that disagree. I think that's evident in the Book of Mormon. And I know what you're talking about. That's totally fine. So the big idea there is that Latter-day Saints are putting a label on a pattern that they see within the scriptures, okay. even though the scriptures do not use the exact express label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the word Trinity doesn't need to be in the Bible for the Trinity to be there. That's not my... Right. It's the explicit doctrine and and bullet points of what it, this can, constitutes the Trinity are not there. That's my issue. The word Trinity doesn't matter. I, the, word, the words great apostasy don't show up in the Book of Mormon, Bible, but I believe it anyway. That's not what right. I'm talking about. So when we talk about a doctrine being or a teaching being in scripture, what do you think that means? That a what? That a doctrine would be found in the scripture. So that, what does that mean? So that there is a singular passage which explains uh, from a, a singular author something clearly. But even then, we're translating it from, from languages that are essentially dead. And, and for every definition of every word, it's going to have some sort of different little twist, little uh, difference in language in our language today. I mean, like, not to go on another monologue, but like the word uh, adoption. Right? Right now, our word adoption and that word, and uh, as Paul uses it, yes, could be used the same way, 100%. But there's also cases in which that word was used to adopt, uh, like a, a man had a bastard son. In order for that son to gain the same uh, properties and rights as that father, he would have to be adopted the same way the father would adopt someone who wasn't a son at all. And there's, there's nuances for every single word like that in the New Testament. I know I just went on a little monologue. That's okay. But, but um, is that... Like, continue with what you're saying. Well, think, think with me out loud for a second. There, there's, there's the question of, is a certain doctrine found in the scriptures? And, and it sounds... I, I would say yes. But I would say it would, should probably be done by a singular author, right? Um, well, it just depends on the scope of your summary statement. Sometimes the scope of a summary doctrinal statement is holistic. It just spans multiple authors. It's kind of a bringing together of everything. I, and I, I think you'd agree with me at some level that there's there's an exegesis that has to be done, okay. right? Uh, paying attention to the original authorial intent, and then there's a kind of uh, synthesis of the whole. Is that fair? I, a I, summarizing of what the scriptures in totality speak. I, I don't know if I would claim that for the for the for the biblical canon. What about the LDS canon? I don't think I'd claim that either. I would say. I would say that's true solely for the Book of Mormon alone, but it's written differently than the other books of the LDS. If you just took the Book of Mormon and the DNC, I would not. not, not is is it possible to to read the distinctive LDS canon and the Pearl of Great Price, and then summarize its teaching? No, no, that's not because the purposes of each of those books in the Pearl of Great Price are di they have different purposes. They're for they're used differently. They're for different things. The Book of Mormon is a singular codified text that was abridged by one person who added small plates onto it. That's a different thing than 66 books who were originally addressed to 
uh, most of them, I would say, were addressed to other people. Uh, so how yeah. would you do synthesis? How would you summarize doctrine? I, some, how would I summarize doctrine? How would I find how, doctrine? How, how would you go about summarizing uh, doctrinal truth? If, if not, if, if, you're not if, if the scriptures sort of can't bear the fruit of that. That's how, not what I, but I didn't say that. Forgive me, I'm not trying to mischaracterize yeah. you. I, so the, the question is, how would Dustin seek to synthesize the teaching of your canon? Okay, that's a different question than I was answering. But, um, so I would just, so the purpose of my life is to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ and be in a perfect love and unity with him that I have, be, I have become like him. I have left the presence of God uh, similarly to how Adam and Eve left the presence of God when they were cast out of the garden. That was true when I was born. And in my life, I need to enter back into the presence of Jesus Christ. Or I need to enter back into the presence of the Father by way of Jesus Christ. So what you've just done, as I understand it, is that, you've summarized... I'm sorry to cut you off. No, I think that's perfectly taught within solely the Book of Mo Moses alone. I don't need the Book of Mormon to teach me that. Okay. I, I guess maybe you're not understanding... Like, you've, you've provided a summary... Um, I guess I'm asking you about how do you go about arriving at a summary? Yeah, so I just read the Book of Moses. You read the whole book, and then you summarize what it teaches. Joseph Smith's Book of Moses to clarify. So are you able to take multiple books in your canon and make multi-book summations? That I can find those doctrines elsewhere, sure. But I think you're suggesting to me that I need to, in order to get, like, uh, a find a doctrine, I need to use both things from... Uh, from Leviticus and things from the Book of Mormon and combine them together in order to formulate my doctrine? I don't do that. At least that it's co cognizant of the whole. Right? I don't... The scriptures aren't uh, unimoful to me. They're not I, consistent. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, the, the Bible's not consistent. Uh, that's, my, that's my paradigm. I don't... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... When Latter-day Saints express what they summarize the distinctive LDS canon to teach, I think it's of interest to us evangelicals whether what you're teaching conforms to a historic teaching of your leadership. Yeah, you keep going to this leadership point. I, 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 I don't understand your, your purpose behind it. I feel like you're trying to, uh, instead of you know, talking about you know, doctrinal points, you're trying to entrap me, and I feel like it's just a little bit. You're like attacking Can you uh, my that? character, uh, just not, not, not my character, but the way that I'm going about things because you don't like it. So, like for example, um, uh, like I, the things that I'm saying is now a past leader said, said in the past. That is perfectly consistent because today we have leaders who are saying things different than what leaders have said in the past. I don't understand this this uh, paradigm you're trying to put me in that you know that I'm somehow bound to what prophets who don't even speak my language and who didn't even speak to me I'm somehow bound by them uh, the same way that I'm bound by my living ones today I'm following my living prophets today I, that, I don't I, this, this, you're putting this pattern on me that I just don't think is there what question for you what, what role or what um, relevance do recently deceased LDS leaders have for you well, I don't know what you mean the same the same as Gordon B. Hinckley what? The same as Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, the same as Lorenzo Snow. But not the current president. What do you mean? Like, yeah, this, the same as the current president. Okay, so along those lines, it seems like Latter-day Saints should want to situate their p position. Okay, are, are you suggesting that the Latter-day Saints want everything that, that all the LDS prophets have ever said to be in perfect line? Is that you saying what the LDS want? I've expressed it even more uh, moder modestly. Okay, but, but, but of course, like, of course that's what Latter-day Saints want. I'm sure that's what anyone would want. That's just actually not how it is. And so I don't need to have that parrot. I don't need to put myself in, the, in those bars. Let me express it modestly and tell me what you think. What about just taking stock of what your leaders have spoken about the particular subject and then situating yourself as either in alignment with the, the leaders in general or not? So maybe having your own position, but at least being cognizant of, or perhaps speaking in unity with your own leaders. Does that does that have any bearing for you? Yeah, I, I don't understand how I'm not speaking in unity with my own leaders. Uh, LDS apologists and, and like the modern positions. Or, what do you mean? I, I think a number of Blake Osler's positions, for example, um, aren't in unity with some pretty major historical LDS leaders. 
Uh, okay, a major historical LDS belief is that uh, black people were neutral in heaven. I, mm. I don't believe that. So why would I, why would I try to seek unity with believing that? So you would try to seek unity, perhaps, with the leaders who took the position that, that I assume Latter-day Saint leaders have recently rejected the idea that black people were neutral in premortality. Yeah. Have, have, you, have you read the official declaration from 1978? Yes. But that didn't give any, um, that did not specify the theolog theological justifications for the ban. That, that was part of the drama after the 1978 wouldn't it, declaration. Wouldn't it, yeah, wouldn't it? I mean, if if there was an concerning what that says, wouldn't it necessarily already mean that that? No, there was an internal LDS dispute over whether the theological justifications for the ban still were true. So there was there was back and forth within the LDS community over whether the 1978 declaration should be taken to imply that the justifications previously given for it were incorrect. For to what degree? Okay, so so what is then? I mean, who am I seek unity with? I, just to be clear, I've spoken with Black Latter Day Saints uh, on the public domain sidewalks outside of Temple Square, who themselves took the position that black skin was owing to their behavior and premortality. I, again, you're appealing to Latter Day Saints as you've met. Again, I cannot express enough how little I care about okay. that. Like how little that it affect, like that it's even that it's relevant. That, 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 I, I can tell you, I, I, I have been a Christian, fully active Protestant, that told me that Jesus Christ was a created being. I'm not lying to you. 100% on the mission. You don't care, though, about that. Not really. It's against the Christian teaching. The okay. That, what you, the, this whole black people who are lesser in heaven is against the LDS teaching. It's against scripture, and it's against every major historical Christian figure. Racism is? Uh, whether Jesus was a created being. Oh, sorry. I thought, sorry. I yeah, I mean, it, it, it would go against the, the whole thrust of the, the, the early creeds, the medieval creeds, the Protestant confessions. I don't. That would go. Yeah. That would go against the swath of evangelical Protestant, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox Christianity that yeah, Jesus is all, merely. All yeah. yeah, I don't have any. Problem well, the idea that, that the Jesus creeds, is merely a creed. I mean, we creed. know what yeah. Jesus told Joseph the creeds were. Right. Yeah, I don't have. I don't have an issue with that. My point, though, is that to say that Jesus is created. It, it, let's, let's just take that. I don't want to evade that. I want to, I'm going to, let's just camp on it for just a minute or two. If someone comes to me and says, that I'm a Protestant, but I believe that Jesus is not divine, rather he was created. Or he's divine, but I define that as something like he was created, you know, asterisk, whatever. What, 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 I'm cutting you off. Not cutting, but just for your sure. information, he, he sourced that doctrine from the Bible saying Jesus Christ was the first boy. Yeah. Maybe that'll help you with what yeah. you're Yeah, yeah. Let's, say, let's okay. say he comes and he takes as, as a... Colossians 1, 16 or 17 or something like that. Okay. Uh, he's the firstborn of all creation. He's like, oh, that means that Jesus was a created being, he says, and, and he says, I'm a Protestant. My response to him would not merely be to look at Colossians 1, just zoom out a few verses around that verse, and you can say, oh, that, it's not saying that Jesus is created. He's saying he's the creator of all, all creation. But a part of the, my response is, would be the whole historic church has, under the authority of Scripture, spoken with unity that that verse isn't to be interpreted to mean that Jesus is ultimately a created being. So what I'm doing to this, 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 Protest, this confessed Protestant is I'm saying the, 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 the infallible authority of God's Word, responsible interpretation, right, as the ultimate authority of God's Word, responsibly interpreted, runs the other direction on the deity of Christ and, and, a, and a, as a subordinate authority, as a, as a relevant variable, the whole church speaks in unity against that position under the authority of Scripture. I would say, I would add under your interpretation of the authority of Scripture, not that I agree with that doctrine, or for the whole history of all the Christian churches interpretation of that Scripture, but my point of showing that was that I'm not going to hold you to that standard. I'm not going to tell you Protestants believe in a created Jesus because I heard a Protestant say that, but I feel like that's what you're doing to Latter-day Saints. Well, um, I feel like even especially with this uh, this uh, African American male uh, man that you met at Temple Square. Yeah. And you're, I, I, I mean, I feel like you're, you're kind of. A yeah. It, so if, if your church spoke with sort of uh, unanimous authority that all the theological justifications for the ban in pre-1978 pre were false, right? Then that would be one thing. Correct. Right. 
sorry, wait for the motorcycle. If, if what this young African-American man said to me was contrary to the united position of your own community, that would be different, right? But as the case was, uh, according to the year we were in, because there's a kind of, as I understand it, the LDS tradition has sort of increasingly addressed this, right? But there was a, a, a season of ambiguity over whether the theological justifications given pre-1978 still held. There wasn't a, a Latter-day Saint unity on this issue. When I talk about whether Heavenly Father was a sinful yeah. mortal, for example, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, when Christians affirm that, that God never was a sinful mortal, we're not merely affirming that as our opinion or our mere interpretation of Scripture. What we're doing is we're saying, this is necessarily true, it's beautiful, it, 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 it should provoke worship, and we're speaking in unity with the entire church. Okay, I have an example. Okay. In the Reformation, was there a season of ambiguity for whether or not baptism was necessary for salvation? You'd have to unpack necessary, but there's a, there was a baptismal regeneration for is default it, was view. Was it possible for someone to die having never received baptism and be saved? I, was there a season of ambiguity about that? In the early church there in was. In the Reformation. In the Reformation, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know the historical, uh, whether there's exceptions to this, but it's a pretty standard Protestant view that were justified by faith not by baptism. So I'm not sure. I'm talking about Protestantism. Okay. I'm talking about, I'm talking there about the era. There was a season of ambiguity during the Reformation about what, you know, what, what, how, it, how it to be justified. Can I steal man your case here? For sure. In the early church, there developed a view of bapti baptismal regeneration that seemed to have led to uh, delayed baptisms where people tried to get baptized shortly before they died so that they could sort of cover, cover their butts in and avoid um, serious uh, transgressions that they thought. For how long did that take place? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but that, that, sure, there's seasons of ambiguity, but where I, okay. when I can speak in unity with the church, I want to. Okay, so, so, and and so to the, to the degree apply, I can, yeah, I want to. Yeah, don't apply the season of ambiguity on me if that applies to you as well. Oh, wait, I'm not saying that we don't have ambiguity for certain issues. I'm not, and that's what I'm not, I'm not even, there's nothing about that. That I'm saying there have that, been seasons of ambiguity on sure, big doctrines. Sure, right, right. Huge things. But what I'm saying is where I can speak in unity with the church, I should. And I should seek to max out on unity with the Christian church. Okay, and that's, but that, that's how you perceive that. When, that's what I'm not, do, I'm not doing. Uh, among the Latter-day Saint apologist community, there's a kind of irreverent indifference to your own prophets and apostles. I don't, I don't, I don't have that. I don't, that's, I don't, I'm not a you have, not, You have spoken to that effect. In our conversations. Okay, that's fine that you interpret it that way. I'll defend uh, Bruce L. McConaughey till the day I die. I'm not like, I'm not what you're saying I am. I'm not like that. I can, I can respect that Brigham Young thought that Joseph Smith taught that Adam was God and disagree with him. I can, I can, but I can still respect that he thought that. I can see where he got that idea. Mm -hmm. And if, if it's at all reflected in the scriptures, and, and not care. And not care. But I can still respect it and revere him as a prophet. And, and still disagree. And I don't think that you fully understand that that is, that is, I'm not representing uh, LDS apologists. I'm not representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is, that was my position. You should, uh, I feel like you should ask me that and then rather than tell me that. Ask you what, sorry? That my, that what I'm doing concerning uh, previous Latter-day Saint prophets that I disagree with. Yeah, I, I... Are you telling me that I have some sort of irreverence to them? They are, in they the LDS support. apologetic communi community, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. part of that community. But I feel like, well, why is there a need to... Uh, for, for example, when Blake Osler, correct to my memory, forgive me if I'm wrong, when Blake Osler corrected Neil Maxwell, or when Latter-day Saint... If, if, okay, so if you had some... Sorry, I don't, I'm trying not to cut you off. I just, I, I feel like you're, you're not fine. being consistent. Like, if someone, if your pastor were incorrect, would you want to shout out in front of the whole crowd or try to take him aside? Depends on the severity of the air. <laughs> yeah. If he okay. said Jesus was not Lord or had not resurrected from the dead, or that God was perhaps okay. a sinful I, mortal. I can agree with yeah. that too. Part of sustaining leaders is to, if you disagree with them, not, I mean, Jesus has this thing, right, in the, in the Gospels to take people first and settle things privately, right? It just depends on the severity of the air. Like when P Paul called Peter to account in, in the book of Galatians. Sure, about like uh, discriminating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah okay. we're not living out, not living in step with the gospel and its implications for the social unity of not, the church. Yeah, following the revelation you just received. 
just like, like all right. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I'm not trying to. So he calls him out publicly. Yeah. And I think I think you'd agree with me in principle okay. that, that there so, are some occasions yeah. where if it's serious enough. Yeah. So here's an example. When Bruce M. Conkey wrote in his Mormon doctrine that the Catholic Church was the great and abominable church, was he corrected privately or publicly by the other apostles? Well, it was a public statement. It should have been public. I don't know the answer. It was, well, it was public. It was, it was okay. Point. It was a public correction. Good. I mean, that, that would be that would be principled. When there's a, when I, and, and I'll hold you to this, when Latter Day Saint prophets have publicly taught something, in an authoritative pa- uh, fashion from the General Conference pulpit, to the influence of hundreds of thousands of people, um, and then the church later decides to reverse the position or or to contrast that position, <laughs> there should be a kind of matching public rebuke or repudiation or correction. It should not be a kind of uh, waving of the hand, sort of yeah. glide or slide into the next generation and hope that we don't talk about that. You know what I'm talking It's like, don't, don't sweep it under the rug. Know. I don't know. No, I don't understand. Uh, Adam God would be a really good example where... So, so, you're, I, so you're suggesting that you know what is the good for the church and what the church should do. It's unethical not to... It, it's it's like like you just touched on earlier. It's principled to publicly correct public error that's of severe uh, nature and is of widespread influence. Okay, so is there? Okay, I guess then I don't know. I could be totally wrong. Is mm-hmm. there a time where that did not happen? Adam God, absolutely. Okay, uh, where, so there, where, was, there was there no was, denunciation of Adam God. By well, there wasn't even a, a, an admission uh, that he actually taught it. There was, a, there was a kind of transition into a season in LDS history where there was a kind of, well, we don't know exactly what he meant by that. Who or he? Who is he here? Uh, I'm, I'm, forgive me, I'm, I'm guesstimating here, but Joseph F. Smith, when he was getting letters from LDS members about Adam God, there was a, there was a transitional season in LDS history where sort of the narrative changes. Yeah, so is it, is it possible that uh, that prophet just didn't know? Or is it just... I, I just got... Not yeah, it makes you... It, man, it's possible, but uh, it was pretty clear that he taught it, and there was members that still believed it. Okay, so I, that's why I asked you if it was a quote about Joseph Smith Jr. teaching that, or was it a quote about Brigham Young teaching? Adam God? Yeah. Brigham, of course. Okay, yeah, so maybe... What's Joseph, the difference in this case? The difference is... Brigham Young said that Joseph Smith taught it, but we have we don't really have right. indication of that. And Brigham Young actually did teach it. We don't have any record of Joseph Smith teaching it. That's the difference. Sure. Craig, good to see you, man. Godspeed, you, sir. Yeah, I'm not sure what the minutia here is getting. I, I, so, yeah, yeah, Brigham Young taught it, okay. and he taught it uh, multiple times. I'll, I'll, I'll give you more information on that. It was taught in the LDS endowments, very known. St. George. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was all the temples at that time, but I could be wrong. I'm only aware of it being at the St. George okay, okay. uh, Lecture at the Vale. I'm not questioning that. Okay. I'm asking you about your, your insight on Joseph F. Smith or Joseph Fielding Smith, whichever, whichever one, about how they didn't know whether or not, well, we don't know if Raymond caught it or not. I, there, was, there wasn't a public, he taught it and he was wrong. That came way later, in fact. The, no, but it still came. What are you talking about? When? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't so, know when it came, but it did. Maybe we can revisit this. I'll just tell you my understanding. It, the significance of Bruce McConkie's private letter to Eugene England, where he admits, he concedes that Brigham Young taught uh, things like Adam God, and he was wrong, right? The significance of, I think it was Ezra Taft Benson saying that Adam God was a false doctrine. The significance was that you really didn't have strong representative statements from LDS leaders publicly saying, yes, he did teach it, and it was wrong. It was false teaching. We, we ought not have, have believed that. it. He ought we, not have taught we that. We do have that. When? I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong here. At least Bruce Armacon. That was private. That was a private letter to uh, Eugene England that was leaked. Oh, okay, so did Bruce, I can remember specific, very specific BYU devotionals that I listened to Bruce Armacon where he explicitly goes over this doctrine and teaches how it's false. He never publicly concedes that Brigham taught it, that I know about. I, I, I'll say that provisionally. I'm not, aware, I'm not aware of anywhere where he publicly states that Brigham Young taught it and he's wrong. Okay, I, that's, that, could, that could be true. I have no idea. We'll just, no we could shelve it and return okay. back to it. But the, we can zoom out to the principle. And maybe we can have a little bit of common ground here. Um, when there's private error in, in human relationships in human community, you try, to, you try to start with private correction. Matthew 18, right? The, the more public... Uh, the more public a teaching is, the more authoritative of a position someone's in, 
uh, and I would say the more categorically uh, associated with prophet or apostle they're in, and the more influential that is, the more it calls for a public renunciation, a public rebuke, a public um, correction. And I would say that the LDS yeah, Church has a... Why, it, why do you have that? Like, it, has a, it has a habit of sort of... It has a habit of kind of uh, shifting and sort of generationally making changes without having a kind of concrete, we taught this, we were wrong, we repent, it was a false teaching, and our leaders should not have said that from General Conference, we should not have been in the endowment. Yeah, I don't, we don't have to follow your criteria of how to and how not to uh, retract or, or, or... I don't think it's doctrine. ultimately my criteria, I think it's just no, ethical. I don't, that's your subjective opinion of what it, you know, how it's ethical, I don't, I don't, I don't have the same understanding as you. What is your understanding? How should Adam God have been corrected? I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I don't see any counsel those men, however they want. I don't. I In don't your care. opinion, how should Adam God have been corrected? I have no idea. I have no experience with that. I don't have an opinion on it. Okay. That's not my job. I don't. But it, and it's not your job either, though. I could call you guys out on it. Sure, you can. I mean, you can say whatever you want. I mean, it doesn't mean that your words are going to be taken seriously, or or that. Yeah, maybe not by the LDS apologetic community, but you know, it, it matters. Uh, there, there's a baseline expectation that when someone claims to be a prophet or an apostle, that they teach what is true publicly about God and the gospel. Yeah, you have that false expectation of words in the Bible which you don't even believe, because that is explicitly. There are several cases where that's not what happens in the Bible, and that is your, 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 uh, not your, um, your, not your like your ultimate rule of faith, right? Would you say that Bible is like ultimate rule of faith? If that's your ultimate rule of faith, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Let's use this as an example. Let's say there's a, an LDS apologist who gives what he thinks is an example of a false prophecy by an Old Testament prophet. One of the questions I'm going to have is, is he giving me his private opinion about whether that's a false prophecy? Or is he speaking in unity with LDS prophets and apostles on whether that's a false prophecy? So is this, is this, is this, is this, is this, is this cowboy apologetics? Or is this, uh, is this done in community with your own prophets and apostles? What? If, if, if a pastor is giving a sermon at your church, and every time he reads a scripture, are you going to be like, is this his opinion? Or is this like the consensus of the church? I think what is you, with everything, what, what, what you're talking I think about? what you're, what you're exposing here is that Latter-day Saints look to their prophets and apostles in a similar way that we look to pastors. Uh, but the, 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 difference sure. here, the difference here is that prophets and apostles should be held to a magnitude of higher expectations than a mere, mere pastors I or do. teachers. I do. That's... Right, so when, you're, when your prophets and apostles speak to an issue... It is an, of an order of magnitude more important than when a mere pastor speaks to it. Um, th that's what I believe, sure. In principle, I believe that too. When a prophet or an apostle speaks to an issue, I should not be dismissive of it. I have, I've, never, I've never been dismissive of, of, of anything except for the things explicitly caught against by later Latter-day Saint uh, apostles and prophets. So if, if the LDS apologetics community really gets excited about positing that Old Testament prophets have given false prophecies. My, my, I didn't learn that from them. Well, what I'm, what I'm asking here is, are you speaking in unity with your own religious prophetic tradition? Are you, uh, can you find where your own prophets and apostles agree with you about this particular prophecy? Or are, are you all innovating in a way that can just be overturned in 20 years? Because there's a kind of insta, there's an instability. You're still, you're still not getting it. You're still not getting it. When my prophets and apostles tell us that there are errors in the scriptures and we find an error, whether or not they've ever spoken on that error doesn't make it not an error. What do you, I don't understand this criteria you're, you're, you're I'll give you an example. If someone such as yourself says, oh, this, this Old Testament prophet taught a false prophecy, but when your prophets speak to that, they don't construe it as a they've false prophecy. Never, they've never uh, uh, Look, given... Any, talk about that. Take this hypothetical. If you were to find something that you think is a false prophecy, but you, when your leaders have spoken to it, they don't think it's a false prophecy, what do you do? That hasn't, that won't, that's not going to happen. But if it happened, what would you do? I don't, I what, don't. Would it have any bearing on you that your own prophets and apostles have, have read that same scripture differently than you? No, you're assuming that there's another reading of that scripture. That's what, you're, you're assuming that. Does the interpretation of scripture it's not an interpretation. by your prophets and apostles matter to you? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, so if you believe that it says one thing, but your prophets and apostles have interpreted it to mean something else, does that have any bearing on you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. I can, I can give an example. Ezekiel 37 has been interpreted by, to this day, as in the Preach My Gospel manual, suggesting that uh, the prophecy is about those two nations gathering is about the Book of Mormon and the Bible together. Okay? Mm. When I read that, I and I'm and I'm taking my LDS presuppositions out of it. I see it as about the two nations of Israel and a restoration of the so nations of Israel going back into being one instead of Judah and Israel together, right? Both and or either or for you. So that's what I was, what I was, what I was getting at. Why can't, why can't it be bold? Why can't I agree and respect and fear the interpretations of my Latter-day Saint apostles and also, and also say that this is about uh, the nations of Israel? Why can't I have my cake and eat it too? I don't, I don't, I don't see it's it. harder to do when the when the interpretations are contradictory. So is the interpretation of uh, Moses, or sorry, that King David being called uh, God, even your God has accepted you or has uh, given you a, a set of registers in your hand. Is that interpretation contradictory? No. To, okay, so then I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd go that route either. Again, with, uh, with, with but Matthew. Your, your leaders, when they interpret something a certain way, it has some sort of authoritative bearing in your life. It yeah. matters to you. It's weighty. Right. Yes. That's that's the modest point here is that when Latter Day Saints make a point or when they make a, take a position of interpreting Scripture, it should be done in concert with as much as possible with your own prophets and apostles, not 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 uh, in, yep. not with indifferent irreverence to, but with, with in concert with as much as possible what your own leaders have taught. There's a little taught. website I forgot what it was called, where it has the scripture every scripture reference ever in General Conference. Scriptures that BYU. Is it? I, don't know. EDU, I think so. Yeah. Okay. It's and a great website. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Well, yeah, I, it's a great I, example. I, yeah. I haven't visited that. Uh, Good to see you, man. Take care. Uh, I would... No, hi, that's no, a, that's I, a great point. That. Yes, yeah, I yes. I totally use that. Yes, do that. Yeah, that, yes. I don't have... I haven't found an issue with that. Yes. Uh, great example. Yes. I would massively encourage my LDS apologist frenemies to use that uh, website and to uh, incorporate it into your presentations. If you guys are taking a position... Uh, speak in unity with your own prophets and apostles. If you're taking a position that is not that is a contradistinction to your prophets and apostles, conceivably, at least make note of it. We are making a we I are do. taking. I do make okay. note. Of it. Well, we're we are taking a position that has not been shared by the by the predominant reading of this text by our own prophets and apostles, or we are we are giving this position in was concert that, with that our prophets and apostles. That was true for the DNA in the Book of Mormon. That was true then. That it explains. Sorry, that you mentioned, that you mentioned people, earlier. That, yeah, people were not prophets and apostles had a differing opinion who didn't go out and proclaim that the prophets and apostles are wrong but rather went to them and those prophets and apostles changed the introduction to the Book of Mormon. Okay. That, that, I mean, like, I feel like that's totally fair. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a degree of gaslighting that goes on though when you have a decade go on and it's like there's a kind of quiet hush-hush open secret yeah, our leaders totally botched this but we're not... What are you talking about? Joseph Smith thought that the Book of Mormon took place in North America. Plenty of Latter-day Saints believe that today. I don't. That he, Joseph Smith, as the translator of the Book of Mormon, botched where he thought the location of the Book of Mormon took place. I don't like what's. I don't have any issue with that. You thought? You think Joseph Smith botched the location, the geography of the Book of Mormon? I that word, but that's the word you that just did. Used. I know I just did because you used. It okay. So of the word that you maybe used. you put it more modestly, but do you think Joseph Smith got the geography of the Book of Mormon right? No, I don't. Okay. I think you got it wrong. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. That clarity, that overheardness. Yeah. yeah. All, all Latter-day Saints who believe the Book of Mormon took place in Central America also agree with that. Okay. Yeah. I. I, I guess what I'm pushing for is clarity. Uh, when LDS apologetic positions are, prop, uh, are uh, presented, there should be. So a, you want all, all LDS apologists to agree exactly on the same thing? What I'm. My, my point's more modest. Is that it should be done conscious of what the historic Latter-day Saint prophetic tradition has taught. And you don't feel like it is. Uh, oh, I think there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's true. So, hey, is it Brigham? Yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you, bro. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Brigham. Aaron. Nice to meet you, Aaron. Um, yeah, we were wrapping up. We were going to go get ice cream. Do you want to come? Uh, I'm okay. 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 Yeah. All right, great. Well, that's good to know. I'll take chocolate chip. You're funny. <laughs> um, hey, come with us. Yeah. I'll give you a real clear example. We can wrap it up soon. Yeah. Uh, the Miracle of Forgiveness by Spencer Kemble. Yep. Um, there was uh, what's called the, a neo-orthodoxy movement 
um, there's a book by Kendall White where he talks about Mormon neo-orthodoxy and how um, there's just different streams of LDS thought about the nature of God is like, what grace is. And there were a number of LDS teachers, classically Stephen E. Robinson, who wrote Believing Christ, and Robert Millet, who wrote a number of books. And arguably, they were trying to undo and contradict what, the, the, what damage the miracle of forgiveness had done in its teaching. It, we call it quasi-perfectionism. It, it, sort of the, it taught a standard of what it takes to be forgiven, the kind of prerequisite re- repentance that it takes to then be forgiven. And the neo-orthodoxy movement, within, especially BYU, um, they were trying to really soften not just the rhetoric, but the, 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 the teachings of what it took to be forgiven. Uh, so they, they, were, they were using much softer metaphors, like the bicycle analogy or like that. Or a, a modern expression of this would be Brad Wilcox. You're, have you heard of that? His grace is sufficient? Yeah. Right. So a lot of that is in contradistinction to what Latter-day Saints were teaching. From the, uh, A really clear example of this for me is 2 Nephi 25, 23. After all we can do. We are saved by grace. After all we can do. Right? And there's a really good case to be made that that... That, that originally that probably means something like notwithstanding all that we can do or yeah yeah just I know not trying to any sort of way okay do you know the first time it was used as a actual after all you can do in like today's language you know the first time it was used that way late 1950s late, way later I think it was way later than that. no I've done a um, uh, I've done I could be totally wrong but I'm pretty sure I have I have 1890s like, oh, way earlier. No, like... 1980s? No, about? no, 1890s. Like, way later. Did you say 1950? I think you said 1850. I'll, I'll clarify my point. Yeah. The idea that after all we can do means satisfying prerequisite conditions which merit forgiveness, sort of maxing out on the, all the capacities that you, God's given you to obey, and then, and then you're forgiven. That sort of reading of the after all we can do phraseology started as as far as I can tell in the late 1950s okay. it really peaked and then it waned in the 1990s and you had you still have occurrences of that but the, the big idea here though is that there was a whole generation or two of people who were taught that we only receive certain kinds of grace after all we can do by that by that interpretation of the phrase and then there was a kind of switch where it was like well after all we can do actually means, notwithstanding all that we can do or in spite of yeah, all so we've done. so scholarship gets better and we understand the verse differently. I don't have an issue with that. But even so, even to that point, I don't necessarily disagree with that other interpretation of, of Second Nephi because I have Matthew Bates' understanding of what it means to have faith, what it means to receive grace, which isn't exactly at odds with that either. Well, I mean, the, the modern Latter-day Saint construal of after all we can do is not... I, I, well, it's, it's shifting. It depends on who you talk to. But like... The BYU academics today don't read it the way that LDS prophets and apostles read it roughly from the 50s to the 90s, more or less. There was a switch. There was a, there was a transition. And my point is, is that it seems most ethical to say, oh, our leaders, not our culture got it wrong or just our people got it wrong. Our leaders got it wrong. They publicly misinterpreted, mistaught this passage from the General Conference pulpit, from the Institute from uh, LDS manuals that were given to teenagers, children. It was inculcated in the culture, top down. And it was a false teaching. It was wrong. And now we're correcting that. Now our BYU professors largely are correct. The way I I put this cheekily is uh, we thank the O God for BYU professors to correct the false teachings of LDS prophets and apostles. Yeah, I don't have the understanding. Right. I know. Wait, do I, I find that you uh, are are suggesting that uh, BYU professors can see more than Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles. They think that sometimes. Yeah, well, you're missing the point where uh, the Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles are lay, are, are theologians. Are they interpret scripture publicly for the church. So they're not theologians. They're not philosophers. They're not really studying those arts unless their field specifically before their calling was in those arts, maybe like a little bit like Jeffrey R. Holland. And so when the church has uh, people who write books for Deseret, for scholars like that, it is explicitly their job to go into the history, to do like things like the Joseph Faber's Project, 
and to uh, interpret history and to have a more accurate representation of history, that is explicitly not the province and apostles' job. It's just explicitly not. I don't. I don't. To interpret scripture. And that's not what I said. I said to like to go into the Joseph Smith papers and interpret history and see like who taught what when and all this stuff. That's explicitly not their job. That's that's not what they're claiming to do. How are you linking that with stuff like Second Nephi twenty five twenty three? Because it's not their job to study the English language enough to understand that the word after and that in the way that it was used at that time when the Book of Mormon was translated could have meant uh, despite. It is it is their job to proclaim the doctrine of the church. That is that is their job. Right. So as they're doing that, they're interpreting scripture. Yeah. So when they get up before millions of people in the General Conference pulpit and they interpret a passage like Second Nephi twenty five twenty three, after all we can do. They have a responsibility, I hope you'd agree, to do responsible interpretation and responsible exegesis at some basic level. Before, no. before they get up responsible as a Responsible pos- exegesis? No, that's not at all what like, Matthew was doing. No, what are you talking about responsible Do LDS exegesis? prophets and apostles have a responsibility to responsibly exegete LDS canon from the pulpit of General Conference? I would, no, I would say no. Why they have no? I don't think they have any training in exegesis. Why would I expect them to give perfect exegesis when they use LDS scriptures to teach sermons. Should Latter-day Saints be able to trust Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles to publicly interpret scripture yes. over the church? Yes. Do you trust the LDS prophets and apostles from the 1950s to the 1990s to interpret 2 Nephi 25, 23? I do trust them and respect their interpretations. Okay. 100%. Well, I mean, and would have respected so much to claim that they're even inspired. Okay. So when they, when they interpreted, and maybe this is difficult because uh, you haven't necessarily taken the position that they were wrong, right? I don't want to put that on you. What a, About after all we can do. I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think that, uh, that's a, I can talk about that if you want. It's going to be another monologue. I mean, you can tell me what you're saying. I can if you want. About what it means? About what, what, what you tell me that I think that they're wrong or not wrong? Are, are they wrong? Were they wrong in how they interpreted that passage? I don't necessarily think so, no. Okay. Um, yeah, I... I tell, you about, tell you about this. Let's talk about that in a future date. I think you would circle around on that differently because the way LDS academics have spoken to that passage seems to be pretty clearly against uh, some of the dominant readings of that passage from the 1950s to the 1990s, so... Okay, yeah. I, don't, I think you should read some Brett Schmidt from Professor or BYU Idaho. That'd be one who I think would probably disagree. I think. I think. That he would, he would, uh, he would agree push, more with the back. historic LDS interpretation, the not, 1950s. Uh, not because of what they said, but ultimately, I think so, yes. Okay. And I don't, I don't, I'm, a, I'm not associated with him. I don't want to just throw his name around. What's his, say his name again? Brent Schmidt. Brent Schmidt. Brent, like. Brent yeah. Schmidt. 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 Brent Schmidt. And he's, yeah, is, my, he a, is, a, is a professor? Yeah, but to my understanding, um, I haven't finished his book yet, but it's kind of redefining grace, kind of like Matthew Bates does, but more from a Latter-day Saint perspective. And um, I think that the after all you can do, the 1950s and 1990s interpretation, is able to fit in that paradigm. Maybe he disagrees. I didn't come across his uh, breakdown of that verse yet, but... Um, I don't, I don't just, like, I'm, I believe that there are things that one needs to do in order for grace to be sufficient. That's, that, this is agrees with you. I don't have this, the same Brad Wilcox understanding. I just don't have that. Okay. I appreciate that. I appreciate the clarity. Yeah. Yeah, I think some people present the Brad Wilcox view, sort of the tr- view of the church. Uh, that, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. Well, I mean, what I would hope for is clarity on the fact that there's at least a variety of LDS positions and if one's going to take the Brad Wilcox say reading of 2 Nephi 25-23 that's not yeah anyway or his framework of grace okay if one's going to take his framework on grace and what it takes to get the celestial kingdom or what it takes to be exalted um, well if one's going to, to take his framework for grace um, I would at least hold my latter-day saint friends and frenemies could be overt about where they agree with their own leaders and where they, they're taking issue with their histor- the historic teachings of their leaders. We do that all the time. What are you talking about? We do that constantly. I, I, had a, I had a missionary tell me the other day that like, 
he, he we recited some something that like wasn't doctrine, some opinion about the church. He's like, I call that Bruce doctrine because everything Bruce said is a, his own opinion. That's like, that's I don't think that you're gonna find every Latter Day Saint saying that. But to me, that showed me that's exactly the opposite of what you're saying. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the notion of whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal. There are a variety of positions on whether there's a heavenly grandfather, whether God has always been God prior to the incarnation, uh, whether he had to progress to become a God, and whether he was perhaps a sinful mortal prior to becoming a God. I find similar things throughout the disparate Christianities. Well, to this point, in the Latter-day Saint tradition, there's a variety of positions there. So when when someone takes a position on whether heavenly father was a sinful mortal, perhaps, at least I think it at least should be presented with sort of an overt awareness that this is a position. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a really clear example. On the fair, uh, forgive me, what's the new name for it? Fair Latter-day Saints? Um, you know what fair is. I know what fair is, yeah. I don't know what it's called. Um, like the actual... Yeah, it used to be Fair Mormon. I think it's now Fair... Fair LDS, maybe? Yeah, it used to be Fair LDS. I think it... I have no idea. I actually don't. Uh, forgive me, I forget the, the new name. That's okay, we both know who we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. If you were to look on their wiki, okay. they have a page dedicated to the question answering the question, you know, this, this issue of whether Heavenly Father was perhaps a sinful mortal prior to becoming a deity. And they do a really good job of saying our church really doesn't have a position on this. There's no single position. Yeah, so you it, can't fault me for having a, a disagreeing opinion than everyone else you've ever heard in the streets of you know, Double Square. I don't... That, well, that would, be, that would kind of help my case out, I think. What I'm saying is that that article is really overt about the fact that there's a variety of positions that are explained in different ways. And I would prefer that the Latter-day Saint community just be honest like that. That's what, now, contrast that with people who come out and say, it is the position of the church. The Heavenly Father never was a sinner. I have never said that. I'm, I'm not saying you said that, but there are Latter-day Saints that talk that way. Um, and I don't think that's honest. Okay. That's fine. I, I mean, that goes back to the conversation we had where I mean, that one evangelical I met in, in uh, in uh, Cash Valley, I was telling me that because Jesus Christ is the firstborn, God created Jesus, and that he was that at some point didn't exist. So, so if someone said, uh, those Latter-day Saints who believe Heavenly Father might have been a sinful mortal, they're just ignorant. Uh, the true position is that Heavenly Father never was a sinful mortal. I don't even mortal. believe that. No, I don't even believe that. But you're telling me that Latter-day Saints, uh, that you're going to hold to Latter-day Saints an opinion of people you've met and, and not recognize that there are actually differing opinions? Because there's actually a differing opinion to Jesus Christ being a created being, right? But I'm not, I'm not going to hold you to Jesus Christ created be, being a created being because I heard someone else say that. There's no official LDS institutional position on whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal prior to his exaltation. Yeah, that's what's wrong with that. Well, there's a theological problem with that, but I think the more modest point I'm making is that when Latter-day Saints uh, in the LDS apologetics community present the position that he never was a sinner as the position of the church. I don't church. know of anyone that's done that. Okay. I Sorry, I, I would ask around. I would ask, uh, uh, ask I, I would invite you to have a discussion with Robert Boylan and Travis Anderson on the issue of whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal. And I would encourage all three of you to be upfront about the fact that your church has no official position on whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal why would we need prior to, to exaltation. Why, why, would we have, why would we need to do that? Ask them what they think. I, I, ask... Uh, yeah, see how they've dealt with the issue. Okay, I yeah. okay. I, I I first learned that there even that that there even was a Latter Day Saint position that God had a God who had a God who had a God from Robert Ballin's court podcast. I, I I know their position on that. I, I, mean, that, I that's a pretty dominant position in Latter Day Saint history. Yeah, I I know. Yeah, I know that. I, I learned that from Robert Ballin's podcast. Boy, is that is it Ballin or Boylan? Um, I've heard it called both. I've, okay. I've heard him say Ballin. It might oh. be his accent. Oh, well, I have shuffle wall, so I can't complain about okay. Okay. <laughs> pronunciations. I can't, I can't even pronounce that if I try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, be persnickety about, I have all people, yeah. about last name pronunciations. But, um, well, I mean, the, I, there's a kind of gaslighting that goes on to the evangelical community when certain Latter-day Saint Apostles... Just, just so... Explain it to me like I'm stupid. Just how are you using gaslighting in that context? It's kind of like pretending that it's always been the case that we've had this particular position. That it's, it's always been the position of the church. The Heavenly Father has always been God and that he's never been a sinful I can, mortal. I can, I can agree that maybe the way that they phrase it is, is saying that there's 
it's not possible to interpret the King Folly discourse otherwise. Maybe I'll give you that. I don't think they're making that claim the way you just said, though. I just don't. I don't. Yeah, from yeah. Me, me listening to, to, to specifically Blake Osler on Robert Ballin's podcast, I don't think that that was the position. I, I appreciate when someone takes Blake Osler's position of how to read the King Paul discourse from the Sermon on the Grove. And they, I don't fully agree with him. Sure, sure. But when, when someone takes the, the Osler's, uh, the Os, I call it the Oslerian position, and they say, well, God's always been God except for his incarnational segment of time. Um, but prior to his incarnation, he was always God and he never was a sinner. When people take that position and they say, but uh, we recognize that, um, oh, I should, sorry, I should package that. And they say there's no heavenly grandfather, right? So that's not Blake Goss's view. But there's no heavenly grandfather? Yeah, Blake Goss's view is, is uh, as far as I know, is that the Sermon in the Grove can teach that there is a heavenly grandfather. Not that he believes that. I don't think he believes in spirit birth. That's not what I said. Uh, that's not, I mean, he said, help that, me out. Yeah. So I, to my knowledge and remembrance of, of those dialogues, Blake Osler thinks it's possible that the sermon in the Grove can teach that there's a heavenly grandfather, but he doesn't hold that view. He thinks it's possible to get that interpretation out of my understanding is that he, 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 but he reads it as not teaching that. I'm pretty sure he reads it as it can teach that. Okay. Well, can we revisit that together? Sure. I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's, there's like, I don't know. No, yeah, so a dozen podcasts I had to listen to to find that. To the earlier point, if someone's going to take the position that there's no heavenly grandfather, fine, but at least be honest and open about the fact that that's been a very common teaching by LDS prophets and apostles. That they believe that, sure. That there are there's an ancestry of deities prior to heavenly father. I, I agree uh, that superior, Latter-day Saints believe that, and I'm sure uh, many, not all. Yeah. yeah, many many Latter-day Saints believe that heavenly father progressed to be heavenly father and that he himself has a spirit father above himself. Or who, who this was above himself. Is that fair? Yeah, that's, I haven't, I haven't said, said otherwise. Oh, all right. No, I don't, I'm not being dishonest. Dustin, I know you're out here to do, what was the DNC uh, segment you read? 71. Yeah, do it. Okay. Do it. When you, when you talked to me today, um, you greeted me like my favorite polytheists. Yes, you it's think, being cheeky. I yeah. know. I just was like, you talked to me, to me a lot about being kind. You think that that was kind? Uh, I think it was jovial, okay. but serious. I think a lot of the things I do are jovial. Well, if you were offended by that... I wasn't offended um, by that. I just wanted to hold you to the standards you are trying to hold me to. Well, because I, I do I think you're... I just don't want you to be a hypocrite. Well, I do think uh, you are a polytheist. So. Okay. And I, That's fine. Um, I, I, don't, I think that if your God were to exist, I would want to go to hell. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, take care. Take care, Aaron. Yeah.